Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. What's the difference between a wife and a podcast? After 10 years, a podcast still sucks. <laughs> Oh, that that I, was a that, heartbreaking moment. That's, that's terrible. That's yeah, terrible. But All that's, right. I mean, that's Thank how the you. film sets up this character who's going to be not really redeemed by the end of the movie. I liked that he was fired. I like that too. That was helpful. Spoiler alert: He is fired, but is he fired? Not to spoil He's the last thing of it, right? As her boyfriend, right. but yeah, that, that, that was the a, implication. I think so. Because I was worried that she fired him, and then he's like. Hmm. And she's like, "Oh, uh, no, come on." No, no, that was what was such a relief about that yeah. movie because as as somebody who is a woman and is also as a woman, yeah, I hate sure, I hate sure. that mm-hmm. sentence. But, but I mean, th- look, this movie is about the fact that men and women are so different. <laughs> You're speaking gotta, Venusian right now. We got to right? own our languages. Here, <laughs> no, but you know? what I mean to say is that I've never really seen a movie to this day yeah. about like a woman's struggle with her success being something that sh- is ultimately a triumph at the end. Sure. Right. Like it always uh-huh. like her even career, working girl. Right. Triumphs at the end. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And like and there's this new understanding that like that like she she's gonna get her job back and she she fires the guy. And she then fires but the guy. but he can still be her boyfriend. She can have that kind of the both she can yes. have both of those things, but it but it does mean that he'll have to be like a stay at home dad or something. That's a good point. It's a shame the movie isn't about her. Right. But there is even like that section where they sort of bond. She talks about the fact that she blames herself for like ruining her marriage because of her career and everything. Right. right. He kind of offers a corrective to that. Right. That's like, no, that guy sucked. Yeah. Right. You That's never see that. That's not on you. Yeah. I mean, That's even true. I just recently watched A Star is Born, the, the Barbara Streisand mm-hmm. one. Sure. And like that's another movie about a woman being successful that ultimately like kills the man. Yes, in the, it does. Like, yeah, like yeah, every Spoiler time, alert. every yeah. time. It's like the, I, I, and it was such a relief to me as somebody who wants to continue to find success in my professional life to watch a film that offers this alternative narrative. That's like that actually can work, and like you can be with somebody who might actually really love that about you. Like he does say that in yeah. the film when they're at that. That bar. Is what women want really good? Is that our conclusion? I, I, I'm now okay. more in favor of this movie than I ever have been. I, I, mean, from I have this to say. That is a good You're point. saying that's like a one to a one and a half stars? Is that what well, bumps and it I'll up? say this. Like, I, if, you know, based in nothing other than a reading of her work, I got to think that's kind of a Nancy Myers influence. I mean, I was thinking about her too because all of those movies that I just listed are both of those movies, A Star is Born and... And Working Girl, mm-hmm. which are about like you know successful women, yeah, um, are directed by men. And I was like, this is such a, uh, you know, a, a, what women want offers such a distinctly female or feminine perspective, which yes. is that that's actually like all of the intricacies and the nuance of how difficult that success can actually be. Yeah, um, like for for the, a Star Is Born and Working Girl. Just and we're only com- using those as comparisons. Right, as the, I the three films about women. <laughs> the right. three yeah, films right. about successful right. women. Right. Um, there, it's just the 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 pursuit of success. That movie. It's not about what happens once you actually have it. Right. And Jurassic World is the other example. But I think <laughs> I haven't seen it. Well, in Jurassic oh, World, boy. she's hit the apex, and it's all downhill. From and everyone there, tells right? her that she's making a mistake because she doesn't want to have a boyfriend and kids. Right. Even though really? she's wildly successful running a dinosaur park. Oh, uh, but not that we should keep talking Dream. about that movie on this podcast because <laughs> this is a podcast about filmographies directors who have massive success early on in their career and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion products they want yeah. and this was the passion project this is the no. one that gives her the blank check right. oh and what was the, the passion project well the, her the next rest movie, of her the film. rest of her career but right. especially her next movie something's got to give is like that's oh. where she's writing and directing now because this is she didn't write this movie right. this is the one and, she didn't write you know she gets to hire who she won't write like you know that's right. like her project it's about her obviously the, the rest of her films feel like she's a weird example of someone who got to make really personal really big budget movies in the studio system some of that has to do with just her taste lining up with commercial sensibilities mm-hmm. but something's got to give is like not a movie you would think would be easily greenlit. Even if you have Jack Nicholson, Diane Keaton, her the two biggest stars in that age bracket, you're like, it's kind of like a modest sort of love story about two old people in a house. There's no supernatural moments. No. No, though I have a read 
on that movie that I will debut next week that it is somewhat supernatural. It's a sequel to Wolf. Yeah, because all the white, like, and Diane Keaton's in all white. You think she's, she's an uh-huh. angel? Well, like, the, the movie begins with Jack Nicholson having a heart attack, and uh-huh. then he's trapped in that Hampton's house, and Diane Keaton is sort of swanning around, and, and it's all white, and he's like, reckoning with himself as a person I'm like is he in like purgatory is that what this movie's about You're really blowing the load for next week's episode I know, okay, I know. so I I'll, I'll, did, I'll get into that yeah. so we're not talking about okay. that okay yeah cool. sorry i just watched something but this is the term that was recently sort of uh, uh coined by uh by lux Alptrom, our, our past and future guest was the guarantor like this is the movie that gives her the checkbook okay because this at the time of its release Big hit. The, the, is, the highest grossing romantic comedy ever made yes and it's still number two still number two Almost three years later. Greek wedding. Yeah. Oh my god, my big! I'm so impressed by my big fat I know. Greek wedding. I know. Well done. The Which is movie and my big fat Greek could. wedding is a rom com, but it's also like it's like a family com too, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not, like this is like a rom com. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and it performed in such an insane way. Of course, we're talking about the films of Nancy Myers. This mini series is called What Else But Something's Podcast. Right. <laughs> and today we're right. talking about what went on. Now you see the level of humor on this show. Yeah. Right, oh yeah. Right. Elevated. Uh, Elevated. I mean, you've known Griffin since he was what age? Eleven, and he's had the exact same. I was going to say, yeah. right? How much yeah. is? I think I was twelve. Changed? You were eleven because okay. we met in two thousand two. Yeah. The, we're at sure. that threshold point now, past the threshold point where we've known each other for longer than we haven't known each other. Yeah, which is a weird thing to think about. That's really scary. Like the vast majority of our <laughs> lives, we've known each other and have just been causing each other anxiety and grief. Yeah, like when I was ten minutes late today, and you <sighs> acted like well, I was because I'm never late to anything, and yeah, I just can't right. tolerate. You're it. never late for I anything. Can't tolerate Griffin it. Griffin has been late to. I would conservatively say eighty percent of our <laughs> podcast recordings. <laughs> I have not once years. but twice been two hours late to an episode. <laughs> Isn't it a relief though when someone is later than you? Uh, the it's best feeling always so good when you run and run and then you walk in and you're like, oh, no one's here. Oh, yeah. oh God. Great. No. It's all gone. Like, yeah. Yeah. The greatest feeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, our guest today, a uh, longtime friend, mm. uh, wildly uh, successful actress and musician. And woman. Superstar and woman. Let's <laughs> Number one credit. She's a woman. <laughs> Listen up, folks. Hold for <laughs> we applause. We got a lady for this one. <laughs> uh, Lola Kirk is here. Hey, Lola. No one. Oh, hi. Nice hi. to meet you. Nice no one's clapping. You. No right. one's clapping. So I... Uh, I had mentioned you. We had Becky Drysdale in a previous episode. Oh, my God. We talked Becky. about Summer Camp, which everyone loved. It was the most popular thing that has ever happened on this podcast. People asked for more of it. Really? No, absolutely not. They okay. were curious. They protested in the streets. <laughs> Why am I listening to these fuckers talk about Summer Camp? But your name came up, and then people were like, I didn't know they were friends. She's got to be on the show. Uh, so then I reached out to you and sent you like a whole long list of like the next 30 things we were going to do. And you were like, I don't care. Pick any movie. <laughs> so I was like, I feel like you're going to be angriest about what women want. Oh, my God. Qu- on the contrary. But, which I'm very surprised by because I think David and I have both been sort of dreading talking about this movie. Like, we want to talk about not, Nancy not Myers. Not dreading, but this is the, this is, you know. What what did you guys think movie. was so offensive about the film? Offensive. I, it's more like the film is about a man mm-hmm. who, after a couple of three electrocutions. Yeah. Finally comes to the realization that like women are people too. Like that's about as far as he gets. Right. Right. Which is just a bit of a tough watch in a two hour, 10 minute movie. Right. Right. And that's sold as sort of like a triumph of the human (laughs) spirit that he comes to understand that like women have thoughts and feelings too. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, it's one of those movies that I would file under the like boys will be boys comedies. Sure. Where it's just like everything that's kind of shitty about masculinity is sort of presented as a joke, even though the movie does try to like argue that I, yeah, he I, needs to get out of those habits. Mm-hmm. It still presents it as like kind of charming for most of it. Sure, I, mean, I so I I have a different. Interesting. Interesting. No, that's okay. fine and that's great, but I do, I do think it's like she I think she knows or she wants to argue for the charmingness of such a person, like even mm-hmm. even when it sucks, right? Like she, you know. Nancy I, Myers yeah, I didn't see likes it like these that. sort of like jerky guys. Like, you know, sure, I, because yeah. they are charming, but I right. also think that like it is it, it always kind of like um blew my mind how how rampant like misogyny actually was. Sure. Um and like I I've talked about this a lot. I'm not sure if we talked about this on the last podcast we did together. Or did podcast. Was it a podcast, but then it was written into an oh, article? Whatever. For the believer. Um, yeah. But like growing up in like progressive New York circles, sure. going to schools uh, like the ones that Griffin and I did and, yeah. and camps like the one that Griffin and I went to, I always kind of like imagined that everybody was just like 
really thinking alike. And then yeah, I like the grew up. Thing. Right. And I also realized that that bubble was like completely misogynistic. Yeah, that we right, never even discussed. Itself, sure, the bubble right. itself wasn't like just because everybody liked like, you know, going to the MoMA yeah. and like watching like new wave films. Wow, these yeah. are, like some cool people. Right. <laughs> and like, you know, not wearing bras didn't mean that like people were actually um, forward thinking or, 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 or conscientious about race, class and gender. Like it they almost, weren't upending at all. Yes. Really, and sure. so, so I guess my, like it, 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 it's, um, it's just weird how, how everywhere it is. Like even just walking into this building just now, I was like struggling with my umbrella and opening the door and, and this guy, this was amazing. It was like something out of what women want. This guy walked past me and he was like, you know, just so you know, I would have held the door for you because there were he two other guys. That? Yeah. That's two other guys that didn't. And I was remarkable. like, you know, yeah. it's 2018. Like he thinks that's charming. He actually didn't hold the door for me. Right. So he's, he's just sort of just, announcing. Yeah. His, his, he's retroactively intent, saying right? that he would have been chivalrous with to me. <laughs> yeah. But like wasn't. And I guess so. So I think that like <laughs> Nancy Myers character whatever his name is the, mm. the, the what is nick, his marshall. Name? Nick, nick marshall nick marshall what a name is man like, manerson i think that there's a lot of acceptance in the film that like this is just the way that right. like powerful this is the kind men of person are you're running yeah and running like to. we and 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 what i think when i the first 20 minutes of the movie before he can read women's minds i was just like wow this guy is like the girl that all everyone wants to sleep with or yeah. this guy is the one that everyone wants to sleep with and then when you start hearing women's thoughts I thought it was so cool that everyone who smiles at him actually is like so upset by sure. his, you know, yes, attitude. That's a, yes, that is a, a very good point. And there is something to the fact that like even in the year 2000, this movie is about misogyny. Mm -hmm. Like even if it always isn't always gracefully handled. It's, it's pushing a, the envelope. It's at least a film that's like so much. tackling the shit, mm -hmm. which I have to imagine like this is the only film that she didn't write. Uh, yes, no, it wasn't written by her. Written by Josh Goldsmith, Kathy Yuspa, and Diane Drake. Who go on to be sort of like high concept, you know, fluctuating between high concept comedies and sitcoms. They're sort of just like, you know, journeyman, I think, comedy writer uh, folks. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure she had a hand in like sort of reshaping it, but it's not her story to yeah, begin with. It's a very sense. high concept premise, but you do feel like that's what you gain from having a female director here is that she actually kind of understands the, like, toxicity of uh, this sort of culture. But yeah. the appeal, too. I mean, that's why yeah. I think Nancy Myers is a genius. Yeah. Like she do it's not just, like, a nightmare movie about, like, how horrible he is. Like, she knows yeah. he's appealing, too. Well, I She's just not also think that it. it's one of the first movies that really, like, reveal mainstream movies that reveals the woman's perspective so, so massively. Like, I recently rewatched High Fidelity. I was with a group of friends, mm -hmm. and we were all talking about how much we loved High Fidelity whenever it was out in theaters a million years ago. And then we were like, let's... Same year is this movie. Oh, fascinating and then we watched it and within 15 minutes we were like appalled mm -hmm. well that that's a movie about an appalling person exactly yes. as is this film. Yes, 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 yes 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 and his relationship to every woman in that film is just like so upsetting like the way that he just is like you know Catherine zeta jones actually sucks right, there's right. nothing great about her whatsoever right and like lily taylor is like you know everyone is just so she's like still reduced. sad yes yes and in this film, I think you get to see this dynamic uh, side of of women in in a man's world. Um, and yeah, so I do think that that is the importance of having women filmmakers in general. I mean, it's oh, it, sure. it's so unsurprising to me that we are about that we are you know facing the possibility of having Roe versus Wade overturned, mm -hmm. that reproductive rights are constantly at risk, and that you know. What is it? Something like uh, ninety percent of the top highest-grossing movies in the past ten years are directed by men. We have no women's perspectives anywhere, and so sure. that's why I was even surprised. Um, I don't know. I, you know, High Fidelity ultimately was surprising because I was like, "Oh wow!" As a kid, I thought that this. I wanted to grow up to be Catherine Zeta Jones when mm -hmm. I saw that movie. Sure. Like that was. That was the hope. And and then watching it now, I was like, wow, as a 10-year-old girl, like that was what I wanted. That was what I thought would <laughs> you wanted be to like. Be the, one of the girlfriends exactly. in this movie. Totally. I thought that some loser <sighs> like John Cusack should win, like deserved me. I and, mean, yeah. but high fidelity, like there's so many guys like that who are kind of like where you're like, 
man, if I sit this guy down, he's just kind of a fucking loser. And yeah, he's right, like, right. yeah, I don't know, man. I, I seem to just run through women anyway. And at the end of the movie, his girlfriend is like, you know, you objectively sucked. Yeah. You cheated on me. <laughs> uh, you know, I had an abortion and didn't tell you about it, I think. Right. Like it's like, yeah. yeah and, yeah. you know, all this stuff. You're completely emotionally unavailable. Right. You you really, <laughs> you're, you're sort of an idiot. You, you hang out like with Jack all your Black all the time. You own like a chapters. failing record store. Right. Yeah, right. You own like a <laughs> junky record store. My dad just died, and I and it's between me just sitting here feeling miserable and getting back together with you, and I've decided to get back together. I think with that's you. the best scene. In the that's movie. why I love Them that movie so much. Like that's the, the ending where he's yeah. like, "Okay," and the movie's just like, "Right," you know. Well, that's I guess that's how it goes. David, we like talking. We do. We talk a lot. This is a space in which we talk, both yes. this recording studio and the space of the podcast. That's our platform. That's true. So I mean. Our our sponsors today, Talkspace, feel right in line with it us. It does make sense it that an online sense. therapy company that lets you message a licensed therapist from anywhere would sponsor this show. Yes. Because all you need is a computer with an internet connection, much like uh, listening to this podcast. All you need is a computer with an internet connection. Right. So, like, maybe you're someone who hosts a podcast with a, a good friend who's really bad at responding to emails and texts. Sure. And you're already on the phone waiting for his non-responses. Oh, this sounds like science fiction. Right. You just whip over to Talkspace and go like, can I talk to you about this abusive work relationship I'm in? <laughs> exactly. And it's like, if like this friend you have, mm-hmm. uh, they seem to have a really tight schedule. Well, with Talkspace therapy is really easy. You just send your therapist a message. You get off something off your chest whenever you need to. You talk about challenges at work, about life, about a certain friend with the initials gn right talk there's space, no commute no talk space isn't going to get back to you like four hours later and go like hey sorry i got really deep into kingdom hearts <laughs> isn't like, going to text like two stops away right and actually he's like maybe <laughs> six stops away or or like more often it is two stops but he's not saying they're like express stops and there's <laughs> right. like a lot of space in between like when you think about it, it's actually like nine stops like he's still in manhattan but technically it's two stops away because it's only two q stops <laughs> Uh, and you just got to remember, therapy isn't just about venting uh, your innermost thoughts no. or digging into childhood memories right. or friends' travel plans. It's yeah. about practical everyday strategies for stress management and living a happier life. And so having a therapist helps you, you know, get through that. Right. Gives I, you a person to talk to. I'm talking as someone who's incredibly happy and has no stress in his life. I'm saying I wouldn't know what you would use this service for, but I think you should give it a shot. Uh, yeah. So you can so, be as chill as downtown Griffey now. Exactly. So the Talkspace platform has 2,000 licensed therapists who are experienced in addressing life challenges that we all face. 2,000! So to match with the perfect therapist for a fraction of the price of a traditional therapy, you go to Talkspace.com slash check and you use the code check to get 45 bucks off your first month and show your support oh, for this show. Well, David, I'll say that's the one thing that sounds annoying about this. You have to send them a check no. in the mail? You have to write them a check no. in order to pay for this? No. Can't you do it off your phone or something? No, you just go to Talkspace.com slash check and you use the code oh, check. $45 off in your first month. Check. That sounds great. I love the movie Working Girl so much because, mm-hmm. and I think when That's I saw that run. film, I, I was blown away that in the 80s, they were making like movies about empowered women. Because sure. I do think that that movie really is. And I was like, what happened yeah. between 1983? I think that movie came out. 88. 88. 88. What happened between 1988 and like now yeah. that like we don't that we're fighting to see movies about women being successful. Yeah, that's I think, a good question. I think there are a number of things. I mean, I know I uh, mm. I might have brought this up on the podcast. For, for one, this genre is dead. Right. I mean, it, it sort what of seems the, genre? the like the sort of rom com genre. Uh-huh. Like which Working Girl is too, but those are as you say, both sort of movies that are stealthily about other things while right, having right, a romance right. at their right. core. And then there's the parallel genre which working girl falls into nine to five falls into i would mm-hmm. even argue the intern falls into broadcast which news. is like yeah right, broadcast oh, news broadcast. which they're they're sort of workplace comedy right. starring workplace movie. Women. right and right. now hollywood's which just was like that really sounds like a tv show are you interested in making a tv show like yeah, you know right. what i mean like they, they a, just like right a i think they put those things onto tv b i think it's one of the really negative side effects of like the the globalization of the film industry right Right. Is that shit just doesn't translate to other countries? Yeah, like, right. It mm-hmm. sounds fine, but does China want to watch this movie? Right. Interesting. Because uh, A, you know? humor is culturally specific. Uh-huh. And it's always been that, like, comedies don't translate as well to other countries as well as um, uh, any other genre. And then you add in, like, workplace dynamics and, like, sexual dynamics and all those things become even more cultural that they have a hard time translating, except for a movie like this that did really fucking well overseas and also got, like, there's a Chinese remake of this movie. 
Right. And I think they announced they're going to do a Bollywood one too. Sure. Gong Li is is. I mean, the, it's yeah. a high concept. He learns right. what he's, uh, his right. brains the brains. But, he also but becomes is, like yeah. a great father, and that part to me was really moving. We're going to talk about it. Okay, great. I'm going to dig into it. I'm looking at right here, like the top 10 romantic comedies of all time. And of the 10, two of them are directed by women. Which one? What's the other one? It's this and The Proposal are the only two. What's The Proposal? Uh, Ryan Reynolds and Sandra Bullock. Yeah, that's it. And Fletcher. Right. Romley's favorite movie of all time. Oh, my God. But it's My Big Fat Greek Wedding, Hitch. Pretty Woman, Something About Mary, Crazy Rich Asians, Sex and the City One, Runaway Bride, Knocked Up, all directed by men. So you go like, this is a genre that is usually derisively referred to as chick flicks. And they're all defined by men. Yeah. And are mostly male writers too, or male male directors reinterpreting female writers' works. And all the moments that are good in this movie are just like perspective shift stuff that Nancy Myers clearly brought in that I don't think she was like, I'm going to fucking revolutionize, like, you know like within this movie like Trojan horse like some subversive gender politics I think she's just a woman she comes from that base of experience and on set she'd be like well you should do this but it's also like a really smart way to keep it mainstream and deliver a subversive message yes I think so I'm not I I don't know if it's so simple as I'm just a woman I think there's something quite genius about it which is like let's take the most like you know, blockbustery genre besides mm-hmm. an action film that we can like yeah. a, 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 a a money making genre, and let's like you know put in all of these really high concept ideas, which is that like newsflash, women have feelings and aren't <laughs> right. treated like that at all. I mean, this is a really good take because it's like everything that I resent about this movie. You're kind of empowering, but I, I, I mean, thought it was so empowering. I I don't want to like sound like I'm belittling her by being like, oh, she's not choosing to do that stuff. It just comes from her base of experience. But Mm -hmm. it is like the big reason why I think you want diversity in the voices behind studio films because you see these moments where it's just like, well, that's just second nature. And you realize that like 95% of movies ever made have been made by the same type of people. Exactly. Not even just like the same race and the same gender orientation, you know, and all of that sort of stuff. But even just like similar socioeconomic classes, Mm -hmm. similar backgrounds, you know, you just like when you see films made by other people, you're like, oh, that's an interesting thing I've never seen in a movie before. I think she's also always been and still is like someone who's good at taking a very famous male star Mm -hmm. with like a real like, you know, defined movie star image. Mel Gibson. I'm thinking Nicholson. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking De Niro. Mm -hmm. Thinking of Alec Baldwin. I mean, yeah. And making them incredibly vulnerable on screen. Like she's good at getting them. And this is. The least of those, but still, like you know, Gibson's vulnerable, like you know, and she 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 tries to like make him a little more of a person by the I end of it. I was yeah. surprised by how vulnerable she does successfully make him in the last thirty minutes, because that's the whole other element of this movie is just the Mel Gibson thing. He's just also a little maniacal, like he's right. intense. Well, like, yeah, he's an intense. I mean, there person. is also, I think, you know, I think that the patriarchy negatively affects men just as much as it does mm-hmm. women. I think that there are these standards of how we think that we need to behave based on these patriarchal rules and i think that it's there is this not problematic but like maybe questionable moment when like his um you know we normalize being emotionally available and aware as as something that is feminine right and right. marisa tomei's only explanation for why this person could know what she wants right. And not like her is that he's gay. That's the worst scene in the movie. It, no it's a pretty it's bad the scene. The Tomei subplot. I mean, is, she's is so tough. good in she's the movie so that like she's, she makes it. But, but that also makes it doubly upsetting right, you're like, how they treat her. You're like an right. Oscar winner, Marissa Tomei is playing this role in this right. movie. And this is the kind of movie you were named after. I, know, I was, I was named say, after. Yeah. I was. My parents <laughs> didn't name me until 2010. Yeah, they were waiting. 2000. They were waiting. You were girl three. I was girl three. It's true. And then they were like, Lola, we want you to grow up and be just like that lonely wannabe actress <laughs> in what women want. They really kind of put a witch's curse on you. In that I know, story. it's true. I mean, Lola is a name that really just has this ridiculous... Yeah. I mean, it, first of all, it's an it, it, it's short for Dolores, which means pain, I think, or like suffering. I never realized that. In yeah. Spanish. Right. Um, Dolor. Yeah. And every character that's named Lola... Sorrows. Sorrows, thank you. Mm-hmm. Quite, um, I'm just thinking about it. It's quite a, quite a thing to name your kid. It's always some like vampy girl. Well, she go like whatever Lola wants, except for the kink song. No, well, yeah, yeah, but she's a vamp too. Right, right. Okay, but then I'm thinking it's it's a William Inge play. It's it, it, it maybe come back, little Sheba. Okay. She's like the sad wife of an alcoholic. Yeah. 
Oh, so anyway, there's always something about like the, lo, the name Lola, just to speak of characters, mm-hmm. is like about like this. It's she's like a showgirl who's like in pain. Well, that's you go the two <laughs> famous Lola songs, which like songs can really do. Or name Lola more was a else. showgirl. Oh, that too. There's three. But you go like whatever Lola wants is literally like Satan's temptress. <laughs> yeah, right? right. And damn Yankees. Mm-hmm. And then the kink song is like, uh, she tried to trick me. Well, she's right. still a temptress. Right, right. 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 But it's right. like with the added element of like, how dare they? Right, right. And then she's like a showgirl at the Copacabana. Right. So thanks, mom and dad. Because <laughs> ultimately. <laughs> you and your siblings were, or you and your sisters at least, were all named after like classic rock songs. Right. But I don't they were know all they like, knew that. Oh, really? Well, I always thought it was conscious, but I always thought it was kind of funny that they like removed. Actually, we were all named after socialites. Is really? that actually so true? true? So who are you so named So Domino after? is named after Domino Harvey, who uh-huh. wasn't right. yet, um, I think, a, 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 a bounty hunter. Sure. I think she was just like Lawrence Harvey's cute yeah, daughter. Yes, right. the, the subject of the film Domino. Yes. Starring Keira Knightley. Um, not my the name is Domino. Oh Domino. My name Fenders. is Domino. My, my name, name is Domino Harvey. You remember that trailer where <laughs> wow. they just played that like six times? It was literally times, just right? Of that. course, yeah. 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 Written by Richard Kelly. Um, wow. Past, future guest. So crazy that you know that. Future guest. Yeah, okay, so I, Domino was that. Jemima was named after Jemima Khan. Okay. Right. Who was Jemima Goldsmith. Who was just like a beautiful girl riding horses when my mom was younger too. So, my, and yeah. I was named after. I mean, I guess we could call her a socialite. I was named after Lola Schnabel. Really? Yeah. Julian Schnabel. Julian Schnabel's daughter. She's not that okay. much older than you. Is she? I know. My mom met her when she was like a little kid playing on the beach. That's All of so these weird. girls so were like. So your mom would just meet like a cool kid and be like, "Great name." Yeah, I'm taking yeah, like, that yeah, name because yeah, yeah, yeah. I always thought it was like the King song, Joanna Surrender. I know. I think and, that was and, the urban legend that went around our high school because that was like pretty dramatic. That was I like, like that they named way their better. daughters after rock songs. I know. I, I like that better than being named after socialites because, again, <laughs> yeah. here's the thing about that. I think that that really informed what my expectations should be as mm-hmm. as a woman. Like, grow up to be famous because of the, your associations with other famous people instead of grow up to be successful sure. grow up to be Catherine Zeta Jones who's who's beloved because she's awful instead yeah. of grow up to be you know you're the most compelling person at the party yeah exactly right. that's your social currency yeah. i'll say i mean i think one of the reasons i struggle with this movie is that even though it is sort of indicting a lot of this behavior it sure. is one of these movies that very didactically goes like, these are men and these are women. Th- there's that problem. Yeah. It's the way I do that they draw that it. line where it's like everyone assumes he must be gay or makes gay jokes or they put right. him in these gay situations. It also just has this concept now. in the middle of it where it's, I mean, we just have to deal with a lot of scenes of a woman thinks something and he repeats it and you just sort of watch it happen over and over again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like that's enough for him to sort of like, you know, bewitch everyone in the room. Right. And like right, not yeah. only is that a little annoying, it's also just a little uh, uh, boring to watch it like j- i'm just talking about like i want to be entertained here like you know right and, the and he just sort flimsy. of succeeds off i mean i'll get i'll get to this in a second but i i feel like you know i was a very emotional kid i'm still an emotional person but i was a very emotional kid I'm and i like hear it. yes uh <laughs> none of you have any knowledge or understanding of that <laughs> no uh, i think of you as calm sort of robotic well adjusted yeah, well exactly. adjusted yeah. yeah that's the key line um good at doing basic things <laughs> yeah But, like, movies like this, even if they're trying to sort of, like, criticize the behavior, do make it go, like, well, this is women and this is men. And I, as a kid who, like, only understood movies, like, they were the only codex I had for understanding the world, always felt fucking weird because I didn't feel like the male characters. So is part of your, like, both of your problem with this film is that the what is the representation of men in the film you feel is too like no, I, know, I, got no I got no beef with that they're I, all a I bunch just of think jerks even if it is trying to make the arguments against men and for women it still is a little didactic in how it represents them right and I feel like this is one of those movies where even though they were damning him I would sit there and go like well am I like fucked up because I'm not like this like when he starts <laughs> acting emotional crisis, like right. that's how I feel like I am all the time. Oh my God. Well, you know? I mean, I feel that Which way. Which just talks about how like the patriarchy like affects men too. Like I think about how many movies fucked me up where I was just like, I guess this is what a boy's supposed to do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's so, you, but I, I, I think kidding. it's not I'm kidding. I'm prism. joking. I, my God, you Through God, you didn't like films. that. You didn't like that One at all. comedy point. I think that that's really important. Yeah. Like, and I, I definitely 
struggle with feeling like square or not cool because there are certain things that that I like morally or creatively won't do. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was recently, I all of my life, I have felt a struggle between like, um, like. I don't know, being a shitty person or not a shitty. I'm trying to think how I should frame this. Like a uh, monster. Mm, no, it's like <laughs> serial killer. What's the term you're looking for? I'm trying to th I, like, I remember growing up and there were like, I, I was a very obedient kid, but I mm -hmm. also like wanted to do a lot of bad things. So my mm -hmm. way of like doing, where were you in the sibling? Were you the, the baby? baby? Okay. But so, you know, I, I think that I, um, aired on the side of just like hanging out with people who I knew would do worse things than me because sure. I would never be brave enough to be like let's steal mom Xanax and sure. like you know have a threesome which <laughs> I, I also think I mean not not to like you know uh, uh, stop me if I'm out of line here but I, you would like talk about this that there was like the complex of like your sisters had been wilder when they were your age right? and you didn't want to like fulfill the prophecy Totally. I think that that's true. But I, I also think that I was very confused about what was expected of me as a woman who wanted to be powerful mm -hmm. and free, um, but also wanted to have like meaningful relationships and like, you know, um, and, and be loving and loved. Because those characters in movies are usually presented as like callous and ultimately right. get their come like up you're either for, this like right. vampy wild woman who cares nothing for other people's feelings or this like ingenue essentially. Yeah. And so I think that this is like an apt thing to talk about because I think that these characters and, and these notions in movies do deeply affect us in our personal yeah. Oh, lives. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think to this day, I still struggle with like what character should I be in the world? And like, I, I think that. I was talking to my friend recently about um, she's married and she's having a baby. Humble brag. What? Humble brag. Go on. <laughs> Sorry, I have friends who are really grown up. Yeah. Well, she's humble bragging <laughs> getting married. <laughs> no, baby. not them. Congrats oh, okay. to them. Humble brag to you. <laughs> she's married and she's having a baby. And we were talking about um, like this Joni Mitchell like archetype of woman. Like Joni Mitchell to me is like always writing about like running away, taking another lover and like mm -hmm. ultimately being alone. And I've always been like, wow, I sh if I want to be cool, I have to do all of those things. And my friend was like, you know that that's internalized misogyny too. Right. And I was like, how is that internalized misogyny? And she said to me that like these notions of like that, that freedom means like being alone and like sowing your wild oats and right. basically fucking everybody that you possibly can. Those are male notions and because the free woman or the the empowered woman is like kind of a phenomenon essentially of the last like 15 years right um something that's been growing over this 20th century but really booming in the 21st century i think that we understand that being powerful means like adopting what has meant power for men and, and also that it's like this sense of like those things are compartmentalized and if you want to be a wild woman that's fine but know that the tax you pay is you end up alone totally <laughs> like it's right, like right. there's, why, there's an yes, algorithm yes. like it ends at the same like you know and that's why i was actually really relieved when i was watching the emotional struggles of, of Helen Hunt's character in that film, because it was it was I, I don't think I've ever seen a successful woman character like articulate that like she doesn't want to be left because she's successful. Sure. Yes. Yeah. That she wants to be loved instead of hated for that thing. She wants to have a home. She, yeah. She's that she wants she both plans of those things for her future. And yeah. she she we imagine gets some version of that at the end of it. And like I, I just, you know. I I didn't really see that represented in movies that I watched when I was younger. Uh, yeah, and I feel like watching this movie, my memory of it, and also like rewatching it last night was like, okay, the first half is like a a weird Mel Gibson high concept, like men are like this, women are like this comedy, and then the second half just becomes this sort of like rom com romance between the two of them. And my struggle was always, I don't think they have a lot of chemistry. And I don't mm. want to see her end up with him because he sucks. Sure. But I, if you view it through the prism of almost like there's a narrative handoff and it becomes about just sort of her internal life, which you get to see because he's hearing her thoughts and you get to hear her thoughts by proxy, the movie does work better. I'll say, I mean, I just remember in high school, a friend of ours who I will not name told me once that she was always in class. She wouldn't answer questions 
because she didn't want to seem as smart as she was because she thought it would be intimidating it's to like boys. Classic phenomenon. Yeah. Which is, Which is uh, just documented like in all education. The theory. most depressing shit in the world. Can so. I actually say, just to add to that, in college one day I woke up, I was a freshman and I was miserable, and I woke up and I couldn't, I couldn't like sit up in bed. Mm-hmm. I had what I found out later was a bruised coccyx. Sure. Do you tailbone. guys know what the coccyx is? It's yeah. a tailbone. Yeah. Oddly named a coccyx. Mm-hmm. And I went to the doctor who told me that and she um, was like, yeah, it actually happens a lot to freshman girls because they have such low self-esteem that they slouch and they sit incorrectly really? in class. That suck yeah isn't that horrific yeah. <sighs> patriarchy breaking coccyxes <laughs> what's the plural of coccyx coxi coxi yeah um, uh yeah so this movie i mean let's talk i saw it's an movie. icon picture which was mel gibson's oh, yeah. production company mel gibson's production oh company. that's what that was yeah. mm-hmm. which is so still, weird it's still running it that logo Feels like it was designed just to be in front of Passion of the Christ. I know, but like, no, it just started with the Hamlet. Christ I know that's what's crazy first, about. You know, and it was Braveheart. Obviously, all his, yeah. you know, Wait, big movies. Wait, can you movies. guys update me on Mel Gibson? Because yeah, let's my talk about Mel Gibson. My boyfriend seemed to be like, oh, Mel, like have a much better, clearer picture of it than I did. That made that movie even more problematic. For David him to watch. literally right before I actually showed just up, had just to had write an article about, about him because he just got hired to make, make a big movie. So my boss was like, "What's basically it's the same question? Like where?" Where are we at with Mel yeah, Gibson? Tell me. So, you know, you got Mel Gibson, Australian, uh, actually American, but moves to Australia as a boy. He yeah. does have a great Australian accent. I he mean, does. American I'm, accent. Sorry. Yes. Both. Yes. Well, he, yes. Lived he can do both. In he lived in America for like York. The, he lived in like Westchester until he was like 10. Uh, yes. Are his um, parents American? His father's Australian, right? No, his father is. Oh, British, right? No, American. Yeah. Oh, crazy. Did his, they just move to Australia? They moved to Australia. Is when his, his full name Melvin? His full name is Mel. Mel? Wow. Gibson. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but uh, yeah, no. Uh, his father is a crazy person. Yeah. Famously insane. Holocaust denier. Holocaust denier, possibly. Uh, one of those Catholics that like doesn't accept Vatican II. So like a sort of like, uh, what do you, like prehistoric Catholic, basically. He doesn't like sequels. Uh, <laughs> exactly. That, that was Vatican his problem. Vatican II. Yeah. That um, was good. Uh, yeah, but moves to Australia, becomes a movie star, right? He's in Gallipoli and You're Living Dangerously I mean, Mad Max the, and Mad Max. And, no, Gallipoli's a start. Really? Yeah, I, I thought Mad so. Max was his first film. I don't think so. I think but. that's true. The story also is that he gave his friend a ride to the Mad Max audition, had gotten a bar fight the night before, and George Miller was like, who's that guy? You're right. Looked like Mad Max first. Thank you. Well done. But Because I think it's important that Mel Gibson's career – was founded both his Australian career and then his successful transition to the States is founded on level. him being a maniac. Yeah, he's crazy. Mm. It was like Mad Max. It's like, here's this guy. He goes crazy. He's got these eyes, you right. know, these eyes that are always sort of like dancing around. He like always he just looks, looks like so intense. he's on the verge of just like having a full mental break. And then like he spends basically, you know, he's in Lethal Weapon, which brings him to the States. he plays a guy States. who's on the edge. And yeah. like he spends mm. like, I would say basically 15 years being like, one of the biggest movie stars. Right. Then he sort of dulls the Wins, blade a little makes, bit and becomes more acceptable, is a little less crazy, a little less manic for a while. But I mean, like, tons of big movies. Huge. And makes Braveheart, obviously. Wins, wins Best Oscars. Picture, wins Best Director. And then this. He's like the guy Jesus. in Hollywood. And this is his biggest year, arguably, because he has. The Patriot and this. And, and Chicken, Chicken Run. Run. His oh greatest. Oh my God, film. I loved Chicken Run. Yeah, yeah fucking Run. He's the my American whole life Chicken. flashed before me eyes. It was really boring. <laughs> <laughs> great line. It's a great line. I don't line. want to be a pie. I don't like gravy. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, after this, he does We Were Soldiers and Signs in 2002. Signs, which ends up being his biggest hit. He ever. makes The Passion of the Christ in 2004, which is, I think, when people start to wonder, like, what's up with Mel Gibson? <laughs> right. Making an Aramaic, like, snuff film about but, Jesus. But just to say two stats, this year, 2000, he is the first actor to have $300 million movies in one year. Okay. And he also becomes the highest paid actor in Hollywood. Right, he gets 25 he's, for The Patriot. Yeah. So he's like top of the roost. Top of the roost. He makes two more movies. The last film he makes is his biggest hit ever. And then he's like, I'm going to make a fucking self-financed Jesus biopic in right. a dead and it, language. And it makes a gazillion dollars. Right. Everyone's reaction to that was, he's insane. He's ruining his career. Then and it becomes the most profitable film in history. But it's also what? Accused, accused. Yes. And also accused of anti-Semitism. Right. Right. Um, and then there, he makes Apocalypto, which is a uh, film about the Mayans. It, it's his best 
film. It's an awesome movie. Yeah, it's like seen really, really insane. Movies, yeah, and Brace pretty much right after that is when he's arrested like for drunk driving and rants about how all the Jews, Jews are responsible for all the problems in the world and that, calls the cops sugar tits. That you know, was the that thing. Was like already like, he was known as like a conservative and like yes. a Christian sort of like extremist. But he always kind of kept it like on the down low, and this was kind still an of. era it's where it's the pre-internet era. So his his the, when he would say shit, it wouldn't you know that's the thing linger in the same internet. Way. You could really craft a persona and stick to it because you didn't have to be that out there all the time. You mm-hmm. know, like it was like he'll be on the Tonight Show once a year, right? Right. You know, like so. Uh, the, the Passion of the Christ was when people started going like stodgy. Is this movie anti-Semitic? And he was kind of like, no, no, you know. But then a year sure. later, while he gets arrested, he says all this shit. Jews okay. are responsible for other worlds in the world, this and that. And then he's sort of like Apocalypto comes out after that, does pretty well. But he vanishes. He vanishes, doesn't direct another goes movie, doesn't rehab. star in another movie, goes in rehab, goes through a divorce. Yep. He has one of the biggest divorce payouts ever because he well, made how much? Four hundred million dollars. Oh, to a, Robin. A, she was married to him for like the eighties, like for yeah, you know, decades. Forever. And it had like ten kids with her. A lot of that was because he saw finance Passion of the Christ, he made like all the money. He's so rich. <laughs> so rich. <laughs> um, and, uh, so this is when he starts to go off the reserve, goes under, and you're like, okay, maybe he's sort of getting his life back together. Uh-huh. Comes back, does a couple... Edge of Darkness. Which no one sees. Yeah. What is Edge of Darkness? It's like a, exactly. It's like a revenge movie. It's like a remake of a thriller, BBC British TV. It, was a, it did fine. Yeah. Whatever. And then he uh, gets... Um, uh, his ex, his girlfriend, Oksana Gregoria, I think her name mm-hmm. is, uh, files uh, charges against him for domestic violence, records him. There's that very Pregnant shocking recording. Yes. Uh, oh, right. Where he's okay. saying all this I insanely bad to shit that. to right. him. And she's like, you hit me. And he says, you deserved it. It's all on the tapes. Who? What agency is he with? Uh, he was with, I, it's a good question. Are you I about to answer decide that whether question. you leave your agency? He no. Was with, uh, he was with, he, Ari Emanuel was his agent. Uh, and Ari Emanuel fires him mm-hmm. after this. Good. As a proud uh, Jew. Yeah, you know, it famously wrote a big article throwing him under the bus in 2006. The agency yeah. didn't actually fire him until this. Oh, wow. Um, That's insane. And, you know, so then he he makes, uh, in whatever, I guess he goes back to rehab. I don't, you know, I don't know. He pleads no contest to domestic violence. So... Mm-hmm. You know, did it right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, three years probation. I and literally just wrote an article is, about this. Is so damn. The tape is I, very I remember shocking. That he, sa- he says, like, uh, he in one sentence, like, involves like racial prejudice, yeah. uh, sexual assault. Yeah, it's like, very mani- bad. like it's like incredible how bad it is. Uh, and uh, Jodie Foster puts him in the Beaver the year after that. She does. She, she she's had two. <laughs> He has had two big people who keep on publicly. Jodie Foster always stick up for him and say, and, like, and Robert Downey Jr. Guy. is the other one. Because when Robert Downey Jr. was going through, he like, stuck his neck out for Robert Downey Jr. So I think Robert Downey Jr. has like some sort of. When he was in the depths of his addiction problems, uh, Gibson Mel Gibson him, put up yeah. the insurance bond to have him co star in Air America. And apparently was always kind of like well, a, no, attempting did it to be again a sober for the scene detective. Him. Yes. Right. So Robert Downey Jr. has always been like, I was unhirable for years and years. I was a fucking mess. We got to give Mel another chance. And Jodie Foster, for no clear reason, has been like, I know this man. I vouch for his Maverick character. Together. Right. But but the Jodie Foster thing, there's not a clear tie Whatever. other she, than her saying he's a good friend of mine. She'll stick up for him. People yeah. deserve second chances, and then third chances, fourth chances, that, fifth chances. That movie's a bomb. Yeah. And is very strange. Movie. Which was like the hottest script in Hollywood and Which then became a movie again? that didn't it's exist. The one where he has like a beaver puppet on his hand and it like goes like, oh, I I'm a beaver. When was that? 2011. 2009. Like Jennifer yeah. Lawrence. Who, it was like is a it early it? Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. Anton Yelkin. I fought so hard for that fucking Anton Yelkin part. <laughs> Did you? So hard. Did you audition for Jody? I didn't because it yeah. was like she was seeing very few people. It was just taping, but I think I got is she somewhere. She's in it. it too, right? She's in it and she directed she's the it. the wife, right. right yeah. But it was like the hottest script and they were like, Jay Roach is going to make it with Steve Carell because it was like a comedy. Right, and it, then suddenly it was like, Jodie Foster is going to make it well, with Mel Gibson. Do, you know do you know how it ends? I mean, you know how it yeah. ends. Right. He, cuts he, off spoiler his hand. alert, he cuts his hand off with he, a buzzsaw. He's like a guy going Jeez. through like a manic episode right. who has a disassociative sort of like break. And starts externalizing There's his mania. There's so much you have to get through with Mel Gibson. Through a Gibson. beaver hand puppet. Yeah. Right. And who talks puppets, in an Australian accent. Right. Who becomes cool. very successful and like takes over his life, but becomes like the head of his business, romances his wife. <laughs> and then he realizes the puppet's evil. And the way he ends the movie is by cutting off his hand. Yeah. It's an insane His arm, film. pretty much. I mean, but like, that was like, yeah, like number one of the blacklist. And they were like, this, this script's going places. Yeah. It was one of those scripts that I think bewitched Hollywood by being so odd, but. 
I don't right, know, whatever. Right. I remember reading it and being like, yup. <laughs> right, right, And right. now I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, again, he is, he does pop up in things like The Expendables 3 or whatever, but like he doesn't really have a serious role. And, and like machete kills. Like the right. joke becomes like, oh, look, he's bruised. We're putting him in schlocky genre stuff as the villain. He's just right. sort but of But it's scumbag. like a two-scene appearance or whatever. Right, yeah, yeah, for how much money, though? Oh, I don't right. know. And then he was supposed to be in Hangover Two, yeah, they and they and the guys all got together and were like, we refused, and it became right. big publicity. Was, that, that was right. Like that was 2010. Helms that and was, Cooper were like, we won't let him be in this movie. Right. That's cool. Um, yeah. and that was a Warner Brothers movie, and uh, and then he makes Hacksaw Ridge, right? This which film, he doesn't, he's not in it, but he writes and directs, makes it through the Australian film industry, which is why it's entirely Australian cast has yeah. big tax rebates. Wait, he makes it outside the studio system. Garf- Garfunkel, Garf- Andrew Garfunkel. Garfunkel. There yeah, are Andrew two Garfunkel non-Australian in actors in that entire film. And it's Andrew Garfield and Vince British. Vaughn, right. and everyone else is Australian. It takes place in the South. Yeah, it's That's a weird movie. Awesome. Yeah. And everyone's got those wacky accents. Right. And then it somehow gets nominated for fucking picture and director. It's everyone's a hit. Like, He's it's back. well received. It gets nominated for the Oscars. I, right in time for me too, right? right like right. right before. He literally is been has been interviewed on the red carpet about like what do you think of Me Too? And he's been like, I think it's very good, you know, people yeah, are being exposed. Yeah. 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 You know, like he's given like the oh perfunctory answers. Like I've gone through all of this because I just had to. Like and then he was in Daddy's Home too. Right. It's one of the now, daddy daddies. Now the joke becomes like, let's reclaim him, but own the fact that he's a scumbag. He's scary, right? Right. Yeah. He does his weird police brutality movie that I guess played at Toronto, right? He, that's yeah, but that's an indie movie, you yeah. know. But yes, he uh, directs an indie movie. No, no, that's he's just he's it. in it. Yeah. yeah, and now he he which monsters and men. Uh, it's called uh, Dragged uh, Across Concrete. Yeah. Oh, okay. great title for a police. Patrol. Um, and that Sad. that was produced by a a right wing uh, <laughs> film company. Though. Yes, like it expressly. Anyway, get, get a get the Gringo, which is like a weird fucking movie. Like he's just doing kind of odd stuff, and he's got like a crazy wilderness man beard, and his eyes are insane. There's an interview I am sort of obsessed with, uh, for when he was on the awards circuit for Hacksaw Ridge. And he keeps on rubbing his hands together and they audibly sound like sandpaper. Ew. Like every time he goes <laughs> like this, it's like. <laughs> My boss uh, at the Atlantic once like interviewed him years because he was trying to make like a Maccabees movie. Mm-hmm. With like, Joe Esterhass. Yeah, who yeah. then quit because he said this guy's an anti-Semite and wrote a big op-ed saying the crazy anti-Semitic things that Mel Gibson said to him and said. I don't think he ever intended to make this movie. I think he was trying to just correct his image as an anti-Semite. And my my boss wrote an article and basically just came away with it being like, I honestly, the anti-Semitic shit, I can't even tell because my main diagnosis is that that man is mentally ill. Like, I mean, you know, yeah, like that's as I'm sure my, he is, right, though. Yeah. Which is, doesn't offer an apology, but he is it a just mentally like, ill man just with came away with like, That guy is right. crazy. Right. Well, um, also, like, right. narcissism is a mental illness. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. I looked it up recently because I'd always been throwing that around loosely to describe mo- most of my friends yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was like yeah the people it, we grew up with yeah, yeah. like it's a progressive <laughs> disease which mm-hmm. is really fascinating it's like uh, incurable essentially mm-hmm. you can like treat it with therapy or whatnot or, or electing them as president or electing them as president that really <laughs> cures it but it, it sounds like i just think it's a it's a lot more you know um present than we imagine it is in Hollywood and that's what I just to bring it back to what women want like that's what I think is so fascinating about the the archetype of man that they are that they are discussing is there it Mm -hmm. is this like scary disgusting man that none of us want to believe exists yes um he appears not just in mel gibson but also in alan alda's character and then that other actor who was in lots of movies in the 90s um like they're all douchebags essentially yeah there's no good man in this movie no and no. i think that you know i think that that's because not to be trite or anything but like a good man is hard to find especially in powerful circles mm-hmm. um and i think that there are plenty of amazing men that i know but i think that you know the patriarchy peddles this notion of masculinity that is toxic and that is um you know uh not inclusive of what women want in the world. Well, uh, great use of the title, but Thank also uh, it, it is that sort of like absolute power corrupts absolutely thing, which is mm. like even if someone has some values, those values tend to get corrupted as concessions and sacrifices to get ahead. 
if you're like sort of yeah. in environments where everyone's like, well, we know that women can't tie their own shoes. <laughs> then you go like, I guess I got to follow that. If I can get the next promotion, I'll yeah. say, hey, you know, the thing about women, <laughs> no good with shoelaces. Well, it's also just interesting like to hear that mini biography of the last 20 years of Mel Gibson's yeah. career because well, the, it ends with him getting hired to remake the wild bunch that's that's what just happened a movie okay, made by you. another like conservative lunatic sam peckinpah who, who oh. was a good visceral filmmaker i actually right, don't think i like sam peckinpah movies i'm, I'm so sam bored peckinpah. uh it's it, he's tricky he sure. made pat garrett and billy the kid or no yes one of my favorite right? soundtracks of all time yeah um Straw Dogs is his best movie, and he openly Again, says— Again, don't like Straw Dogs. See, I like Straw Dogs, but I think it works because he failed to make the point he was trying to make. Like, the right. things that are valuable about Straw Dogs are Guys, like— we can't. We're not going we to get to okay, 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 Sam okay. Peckinpah we're not right yeah, now. Okay. we got to talk about what we want. But just saying, I don't, I don't like his filmmaking. You know who else sure. is a conservative filmmaker I don't like? Clint Eastwood. Always looks like he's walking on the beach and always casts himself in everything. The country, you should see Sully, though. Yeah, uh, Sully. Sully World. Gotta Is he Sully. in Sully? But no. he's not in Sully. It's Hank. He directed, he directed it. it. Oh, Sully, not Tully. No, not Tully. Okay, I think Tully had seen. directed Tully. Yeah. Um. Okay. Anyway, Tully's a great man. <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> Thank you, David. Yeah. You know the confusing time we live in, right? Okay. You can't figure out who's right and who's wrong. But there's one company we know has never done anything wrong. Are you talking about Amazon? I'm talking about Amazon. And here's the thing: not only have they never done anything wrong. They're starting to do even more right. Well, you're talking about their new Prime Video channels where yeah. you can watch thousands of movies and TV shows, including originals, uh, Amazon award winning originals and uh, other channels from like, you know, various other networks you might have Right. Heard you of. can watch The Tick. You can watch shows and movies from Showtime, Stars, HBO, The yeah. Tick, CBS All Access, Noggin, The Tick, PBS Kids, PBS Masterpiece, The Tick. The Tick, Acorn TV, and BritBox. The Tick. I haven't. I have a Prime TV uh -huh. uh, with a. You know, it's all built in. Sounds uh, wonderful. You can get this through like you know various other things like a, a Prime Stick or Kindle or whatever. But yeah. um, I have the TV and it's great. You literally like uh, maybe you just search for a movie you want to watch mm -hmm. and it'll say this is available on Stars. Yeah. Like. And you just add it. You subscribe. It's always a seven-day free trial. It's essentially like having HBO Go or Showtime anytime, but it's built into the one platform. You don't have to open 17 different and apps. I genuinely love it because, yeah, I have like HBO, Stars, Showtime, a few of these but things built into my TV. we're getting ready to watch movies TV. for this show. Yes. I will just talk into my remote and be like, uh, you know, home again right. or whatever we're just recording. And it'll tell me if it's available on any of those channels that I might subscribe to. Right. And you also can watch The Tick. Now, every one of those channels starts with a free trial. Uh, yes, you yeah. get a seven day free trial on any then, channels you haven't tried yet. And, and then it'll get, available. it'll get tagged on to your sort of, you know, Amazon bill or anything like that. Right. The the standard prime membership you pay for, which includes the tick, which is streaming anytime, anywhere. So I have a Fire TV. You can do it on your tablet. You can do it on iOS. You can do it on Android. You can use it as a Fire Stick, anything the like tick, that. Tick, any of those platforms. Anytime. So you can only pay for the channels you want with Prime Video channels. You start your free trials of over 100 channels by visiting tryprimechannels.com slash check. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's all you got to do is check to make sure that you have downloaded all 12 episodes of season one of The Tick and then the deal is done. So it's um, if you want to pay for the channels you want, you can start your free trial of over 100 channels by visiting tryprimechannels.com slash check. Over 100 channels, 12 episodes of The Tick. And, it, you know, just with I'm more saying, coming. And it's a great company. They've never done anything wrong. And maybe now is a really good time to support a show that needs a very vocal uh, a fan response. Tryprimechannels.com slash check. Hmm? Watching. Bezos, he's Watch. so swole. Watch the tech. But but I think this. Wait, n me oh. too. I want to talk about yes. me too. Yes, I I just think that it's really fascinating that um, we have this movement happening and it's making these huge strides, and I'm really happy about that. But no one gets arrested. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets fired with a ginormous settlement. Uh -huh. Sure. Everyone who does get fired with a ginormous settlement should have retired five years ago anyway. Right. It's mostly like, it's people just, saying, like, these people just shouldn't have jobs at the top of the industry. Like, right, is that, right. that's all we ask. But right. It's like, just fascinating that there's a tape of Mel Gibson. Sure. Uh, you know, saying his ex girlfriend being, he beat up deserved it. Yeah. Like, essentially. Like, a tape of him saying And that, that he's getting hired. Yeah. Oh my God. That's yeah. so terrible. And not only that, he hasn't accounted. Like, he said, like, that's the other thing I right. dig through. It's like, he hasn't 
apologized really. He's, he's never, never said like I had a tough time that's and I got through it. He like, always that's goes sort of like, like you know the rocky years. Yeah, as he rubs his sandpaper hands. <laughs> but I think that's the uh, thing is like four he, months after these things. I mean, I feel like every week you go on deadline and there's at least one story that is L.A. Attorney General chooses not to file charges. You know, drops charges against anytime there's been sort of criminal charge placed against any of these people, the L.A. County office is is dropping it, right? And the other thing is, four to six months later, they go like, so so what? They can never come back? Right. Like acting like it's been 15 years and they're overdue for a second shot. And the thing that none of these guys have ever shown is just like real accountability. Well, because, and because any sort that of kind of accountability is not something that I think men are, are told that they should or like, right. you know, are raised to believe they should possess. They treat it like a rote timeout where it's just like, I sat in well, the corner the, for half an hour. The, what do you want? The right. character in What Women Want was raised by L.A. Showgirls. So what do you think of that? Right. Las Vegas like, Showgirls. Las Vegas. Which is, I, I meant that, sorry. Like, LV Showgirls. Kind of listed LV. from Bob Fosse and all that jazz. Sure. Who has like a very similar upbringing. Logan right. Lerman plays young Mel Gibson. But they set it up as this thing. Oh my weird God, that's thing. Logan Lerman. Yeah, which that's is so very funny. weird. They set it up as this thing where it's like, okay, he was like surrounded by women. So right. he was very attuned to But them. like, I guess, very superficial women. Is that the. No, he was that, surrounded right. by women who were like manufactured right, to were, be looked at by men. Right. Because right. there's that weird scene when he is in the office with his two assistants, uh-huh. like. And he doesn't hear anything. Right. And it's right. never addressed That's so again. Weird. Yeah. And it's the idea just like they have no thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's like I, funny I, and really mean. I don't know what it like. The, and it doesn't come up again. Yes. We should definitely write Nancy Myers about that. Like, like what, what do we yeah. what's that gauge scene, Nancy? That? Yeah. I, is right. it that they are honest about their th- they don't have right. other they, thoughts? No, like, that's like the hidden positive. secret. Right. right. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. opposite read is they're so dumb that they literally have nothing. But going then on like their why but they're do not we... like archetypically dumb no, type that's of No, they're, they're not. not they're just right. sort of like brassy older ladies who yeah. help out Mel and Gibson. It's like, like Delta Burke and Valerie yeah. Perrine. Like it's two very overqualified actresses. But like we literally in this movie for an Oscar, Delta Burke had led four sitcoms at this point. But we literally oh in this movie hear the thoughts of a poodle who wants to poop, which is <laughs> yeah, a great I scene. <laughs> I love that French poodles have to be girls. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And that a scene is also generous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I think it's a great moment in yes. American culture. Yeah. But And like, so she, he can hear the dog, but yeah. he can't hear the two la- like. Right. You but, know, the- but I guess this is not a movie with a lot of internal consistency anyway, because like. I don't know. He just like electric. No, and himself. also every right. like thought not, he hears in this movie is very performative. Like it isn't sure. how thoughts actually. He's not work just hearing people sound. being like, "I'm looking at the wall right now." Like, what's over there? It's always you know, people like, saying like, "I wish they would do this right, <laughs> right now." Right, right. Um, like uh, the Weatherman, a film that we'll maybe talk about someday, has a sequence sure. that's Nicolas Cage going to pick up a uh, Chinese takeout, and I think it's the best depiction of an interior monologue I've ever seen. Where you're just like, "That's how your thoughts sound." Okay. And what this is, is like this is how screenwriting sounds. I never know how my thoughts sound. Yeah, I know. It'd be hard to represent like yeah, what's actually like do I think in language? Brain. Yeah, right. Or is or it is just kind of like colors sounds? And mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. it, it takes that liberty where it makes it literal language, but the thing in Weatherman is that like he goes out to pick up the Chinese food takeout and his wife is like, Don't forget the sweet and sour sauce. And the scene is him walking the two blocks. Sweet and, sour, and he keeps sweet, on getting sour. distracted by other thoughts coming through his head. Like yeah. just random little thought fragments. And then he has to try to get back on the sweet and sour sauce. And it's just like, oh, that kind of feels like how your brain works. Mm-hmm. And this is like very concise lines of dialogue. Yeah. Um Yeah. So to give you the plot of the movie, yeah. Who's the ad exec? Lives in Chicago. The king of men. He knows sure, what men right. want. He knows what men want, which is like cigars and to sit in a chair. Yeah, I mean, I don't to know, like, sit in a chair <laughs> right. and, and, and smoke said and cigars. Women can't stop fucking. Sure, but you don't really see a lot of it. You just see his house made going yeah. like, what is it with a thong underwear? And then he has like a perfectly placed lipstick kiss on. Yes, his right, right. That yeah. alludes to last night. Mm-hmm. Right. We don't. Even, we don't even see the woman. We only He's see gone. the underwear. Yes. Yeah. Okay. He got her to bed by ten thirty. Um. And uh, he works at an ad ex- agency that looks like a train station. Like this right, sort of gorgeous. Right. Everyone in <laughs> movies like that. that is successful 
works in advertising. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Also, yeah. everyone in movies that was successful in the mid nineties and an early two thousand. No, li- no, that too. Yeah, mm-hmm. romantic comedies have five jobs in total. But wait, wait, wait. Art Chicago. Gallery. Yeah, well, Chicago. Yeah. I don't know. Such a was Chicago offering be, like a tax rebate or something? Why was Chicago the hot town? Because it sounds serious, and I think that that New York and LA think that normal people who are urban live in Chicago. I think sure, they view sure, Chicago right. as like right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big city exactly. in the middle. It's like a compromise. Uh, and uh, he's uh, got an ex-wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got a daughter played by Ashley Johnson. Wait, okay. She was so charming and wonderful. She, she's adorable. Really she's a great actress. I love yeah. Ashley what, Johnson. What, what kind of became of Ashley? She Johnson? was the little girl on Growing Pains. I That's right. When she was her. like four or five, and then she does work regularly. Now. I mean, she, I think I of her. She's, on a cop she's show in a lot IMDb. of video games, and she uh-huh. is the lead in The Last oh, of Us, right. the greatest video game ever made. Uh-huh. And her performance is wonderful in it. I Wait, always think of I that. don't. I that was like a different language. Yes, I'm so sorry. Yeah. It's like a game about a. a uh, it's a it's game, a very sad video game. It's a very sad video <laughs> about, game. About like survival, and there's a character that looks like Ellen Page, but is played by her in motion capture and voice. Yeah, but how do you play? Well, this is the thing that like games have become more cinematic now that a lot of the game is like just cut scenes. It's like animated scenes that you're watching. Yeah. Without yeah. any sort of but interactivity. You, but the scenes go differently because you're playing the game. Sort of. I mean, she plays a character in the okay. game. I mean, this okay. is it's all this is all brand new shit like what we're talking about yeah. like and this was one of the first games where you're like, I kind of care about these little uh, That's little so funny. Cartoons. It's like the game that makes people cry, and Ben Mendelsohn is like, it's the best piece of art. Of, like, ben Mendelsohn like, is in the game, too? No, he no, just he loves just it. it. <laughs> he keeps on talking about it in interviews, but he loves this fucking game. Um, but she's great, and she's so good in this. Really she's good. She's such a, yeah. She's, she's really so good in a Fast Food Nation, too, where she okay. plays Patricia Arquette's daughter. Um, she likes Meredith Brooks. In yeah, the, in this movie, uh, right? No, it's Don't just we all? it's like a really uh, honest performance in a movie where a lot of people are playing real. Oh, you big. know who she is? She is the last line in the Avengers. She's the waitress talking to the camera. Yes. Yeah, right. They, yeah. She's around. She's in. Stuff. She's around. She works a lot. I think she's so beautiful and charming and the, wonderful in that this movie. This is I one of these movies where just like everyone who has more than four lines of dialogue is somebody. Well, that's an or that's, like Sarah that's, Paul, that's Paul, Paul, every Greer. Nancy Myers right. movie is like that. Yeah, you, where you're like, wait, but he, Sarah Paul and role? Judy Greer weren't. They weren't. They were not. Them. No, I'm saying like yeah. even the people who weren't famous at the time became famous, right. like Lisa Edelston. Yep. Like years before House and shit. And then you have the people like Which Valerie Perrine she? and Delta Burke. Lisa Edelston is one she's of the She's the one other, who's like, yeah. she comes up to him and then she says she's something. She's hot with curly hair. Yes. yes. And then, yeah, and then uh, you know, he hears her being like, God, I hope he doesn't make me listen to another joke or yeah, like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, that. Yeah. Uh, Judy Greer. Yeah. Had she been, what had Judy Greer done before this? this? One of her very first yeah. things. She's so fucking good. Yeah. This was uh, really her start. Because people talk about adaptation and this was two years before that. Yeah, she'd been in like a couple TV. What things? planet are you from? And Three Kings and Jawbreaker. I don't oh, remember weird. her in these movies. So Me she'd been neither. around. Yeah. Uh, She's such a anyway. Good so he's a big actor. jerk. He yeah. writes the ad copy about like boys like surfing. Yeah, 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 that is a good point though. That it's like the opening section of the movie makes it seem like this guy's got it made because everyone's like smiling at him yeah, and charmed totally, by him, and then you find totally. out all that's bullshit. Yes, and then he thinks he's getting the big promotion, but Alan Alda brings him in, and he's like, listen, women apparently are a thing now, so I've hired this lady. Yeah. She's your boss, right? Uh, I, mean, I don't that's- know. Right, they make it sound like uh, there's this new trend in the industry. Uh, women. F- female employment. But I think uh, the thing is, not to be dismissive of that, because I think that that's just... No. So, no, no, I'm not the saying movies, you are. Yeah. I just think that that's what's so true about it. I agree. I think now we have a hard time... Accepting that women weren't accepted, even though that's only yeah, something no, that like New Yorkers. I, I think have. that's yeah. great. I mean, like, because what I like is that he just retreats from it at the end of the movie. Right. He's yeah. like, I screwed up. I don't know. Like, I was just trying to do a trendy thing. Like, he doesn't. It's completely disingenuous that he's hiring. Yes. This person. Totally. Don't, totally. Don't and he Alda, basically says it at the start too. Alda also styled exactly like Dominic Dunn in this movie. Interesting. No. Uh, I'm telling you. Look at a picture. He's got the exact same glasses and hairstyle. He's about three feet taller than Dominic. Other Dunn. than in that you, I think it's the glasses is mainly what you're thinking of the little round glasses I'm right? saying with the glasses I kept on being like I wonder if this was conscious um, and uh, and so Helen Hunt's his new boss uh-huh. and uh, he's got to deal with that I guess and she, he hates women right actually. <laughs> and she talks about like can you figure something out from the female perspective or what and so he decides to embrace that by putting on well, no, women's she items. She demands it. She sends everyone, right. she gives everyone a box yes. and I says, like, box. you're not familiar with these, pro- yeah, it'd be like a familiar great like, door right. gift Familiarize yourself. Yeah. 
But I mean, I feel like the scene of him, uh, you know, putting everything on all at once, he, Gibson plays it like this is a man having a manic episode. So I like saw this movie on TV with friends like, like a year or two ago. We were okay. flipping through channels. And I was like, oh, this movie must age poorly. And we just watched this section. Sure. And I was like, oh, is this movie like absolute lunacy? Right. Because it's also he's kind like, of muttering and like yelling at himself. I mean, you yeah. realize like, oh, actors like movie stars who are able to play scenes like this where characters are saying this much to themselves are successfully looking like someone having a mental breakdown. Like, he looks like a guy muttering to himself on a street corner. Right. Like, wearing pantyhose and stuff. Because he's talking so fucking much. Yeah. And that's that, a great dancer, by the that way. That scene is kind of gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. Like, the fact that, that it's, That 2D like, backdrop of Chicago out the windows, yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, the dance is incredible. The, like, the weird CGI ball bearings. It's amazing it lasts that long. It, does, it goes on, yeah. Yeah, the full dance sequence before he starts doing the product triad, other than... Uh, this what movie has wants. so many Sinatra needle drops. It's well, crazy. The yeah. opening song of the movie is Sammy Davis Jr. Right. singing Something's Gotta Give. Right. Oh. She's calling her shot for the yes, future. but the opening song of Something's Gotta Give is Butterfly. Yes. Did you know that? Oh my God, how it's cool. bizarre. Right, but this has What a Girl Wants and it has Bitch. And other than that, it's like all these old like Rat Pack crooner like swing songs from Nancy Myers. Um, Wait, who plays the boyfriend of Ashley Johnson? Eric Balfour, who was then on like Six Feet Under. Oh. Yeah, Eric Balfour, who played, played like Lauren Ambrose as so many douchebags in yeah. like for like three years. He was he always boyfriend. had that goatee, goatee yeah. which I, I, he still has, as far as I know. Like yeah. that's his look. Oh, and he, I mean, when he's making this movie, he's certainly not eighteen. He's like twenty five. Yeah, right. Right. And she uh, looks like sixteen. I know. Like when she introduces him, I'm like, am I supposed to believe there's two years between these people? Yeah, right. No. He just seems like a grown up who's yeah. like in a band or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, he played so many douchebags. Yeah, I remember him. Uh, what else is he in? Come on, Griffin, help me uh, out. Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. Sure. He plays uh, Jessica Biel's shitty boyfriend who then gets murdered. All right. He was the <laughs> hacker in 24. Right. He's like a bad boy with a gun in like some OC, an OC episode. Uh -huh. He's oh, always that's like, probably what I remember. Him yeah. Like. I love the OC. Of course. Um, but yeah, Lauren Holly, Mel Gibson's ex-wife, who they imply like he, she got like forty million dollars in the divorce, right? Wow, he's rich. Because he says like you look like a million bucks, and she's like more like forty-seven. <laughs> which I think the joke is like that's what oh, she got. No, that's I think the new husband has that money. Oh, yeah, maybe. yeah, oh, that, that makes more sense. Yeah. I mean, he's he's a Chicago ad exec. He's not like a fucking he's oil tycoon. Uh, no, well, but he, he also self uh, financed Passion of the Christ. This character. That's true. In this movie, that <laughs> yeah. already happened. It's right. canon. It's, right. uh, but she's going on her honeymoon. So now Ashley Johnson is staying with Gibson, which she seemingly sure. hasn't done for any prolonged stretch of her childhood. She has like no relationship with he's her a father. He's a bad dad. Bad dad. Bad, bad, bad dad Mel Gibson. So now he's like trying on all the products, acting like a crazy person, yeah, zaps, talking to himself. himself. Right. Which like they, it's quite it's the 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 hair dryer in the air and then it's still in yeah, the air yeah. and, then and it's they still do in the, the air. near miss where he almost right, trips right. and he's, he's like, like oh, dangerous seventy five percent of accidents happen in the bathroom. Right. <laughs> uh, and then he of course immediately then falls again. Sure. Towel falls out, shocks himself, and uh, and then they come home and he can hear her thoughts and he's freaking out and they also see him dressed up in all this true shit. Yeah. Right. Um, so he looks like a person having a crisis. Sure. And then he falls asleep. Sure. Wakes up the next morning and hears hear his women's thoughts. Housekeeper. Yeah. Right. Right. And does this prolonged like? There's the scene with Loretta Devine. Uh, another super overqualified the, person. Uh, doorman, yeah. doorwoman. Yeah. Uh, where she's like that ass like yeah. five right, right, times right. like it's like extremely and he feels extended. objectified for the first time in his life. I know. Life. Yeah. Horrifying. And yeah. the bit is that it keeps on going like. Oh, you really can't keep your thoughts to yourself today, right? He keeps on sure. thinking that they're saying these well, things that's out loud. because psychic power is an unusual yeah, phenomenon. Right, right, right. Not most, most people don't have it. Right. Um, <laughs> but then as he you walks hear the dog and through the park, poop. he realizes Excuse it's- Excuse me, monsieur, I want the poop. Fucking everyone, <laughs> loses his mind, goes to work, Mark Feuerstein, which this is like a big A-list male movie star power play. Uh -huh. I guess it happens sometimes with Who? female movie stars too. 
when big male movie stars want to cast their best friend as someone who's 20 years younger than him. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Are they best friends? Oh, oh, no. no, no. Saying, like, yeah, right, yeah. right, have like a hot guy who's like 28 playing be my like, best friend. like, we're contemporaries, right? right? Yeah, like, yeah. I feel like that always... Like, Seth Rogen tells the story of being 21 and getting hired to play Matt Dillon's best friend. <laughs> right. And he's like, Matt Dillon's like, lived a life. Like, he's like rough. And I just like... <laughs> <laughs> Learn how to drive. Yeah, I can like drink legally in this country, and we apparently look the same now. <laughs> oh my god, um, that's true. I didn't think about that. That's always like an what ego movie stroke is thing. That? Uh, you mean Dupree? you mean Dupree? You mean Dupree? But even like uh, you've got male has that with like Tom Dave Hanks Chappelle. and Dave Chappelle. I mean that that's one of the most amazing ones that Dave right. Chappelle is Tom Hanks. Oh my best god, friend I love in, you. Got right. mail. Of course, Failure to Launch has Sarah Jessica Parker and Zoe Deschanel, and then oh. McConaughey and Bradley Cooper. I guess they're closer. Eh, I but, guess so. But there's usually like at least 10, if not 15 to 20 years between right, right. the well, lead also, their best friend in a romantic comedy. Let me, Mark Furstein, he's just like, I can hear women's thoughts. And he's like, I mean, okay, whatever. I'll I'll take that on board and not think about it ever again. Right? Like he just <laughs> sort of accepts quit. it and doesn't deal with it. Right. And right. Mel Gibson's like, here's the proof. Here's what she's thinking about right. you, which isn't proof. But then he can't get over the notion that she thinks that he's gay. Right. There's other random Because he has like a turtleneck. Right, right. 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 Uh, so he's know. just kind of a cad. Yeah. Gibson goes into the office and is like trying to steal women's thoughts for pitches. But uh, he hears what Anna Gass and I are saying or thinking. Steals her thought, but she denies it. Uh, 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 Advil, it's so light. You, yes. you can take it even when you're faking it. That's kind of a weird scene. Really right. weird that was scene. upsetting. Where he's really yeah. like pressuring her. And he's like, come on, you. <laughs> Joan <right>. w- Wooderson. <laughs> like, he calls yeah, her by full a, name. And yeah. he's like, you're telling me, be honest. You have never thought this to yourself, which if I was her, I'd start screaming. Right. Right. And everyone's kind of like a little tense. It's also like minor sexual abuse. Yeah. Yeah. It's odd. Yeah. I mean, to like make somebody talk about to like, I don't know. It's sexual harassment. It's it, he is I would say. right. He is harassing her. But there is something nice to the fact that like. The earlier scenes where he's pitching stuff and everyone's like, Nick's the man. You go, Nick. (laughs) You assume that the culture was like in these pitch meetings, the women had to like fake a laugh and a smile at the pitches that they knew Alan All was going to prove. Now that Helen Hunt's in charge and he throws out a sexist pitch, everyone is like dead silent. Like the the men laugh and the women are just like, ugh. Like they finally feel free to disapprove. Sure, but I think also the implication of this is like he's learning how to use his new power and this is how you don't use it. Right, where you don't right. just like shout someone's inner secret and they're right, like, oh, right. you're right. Like they, w- I admit it. Yes, my inner secret. You're right. So he realizes, no, what you do is like you just like bounce women's thoughts back at them, sort of calm. Right. I mean, oh, like that's sort of that weird moment too, right before he's trying on all the stuff where he's like, okay, brainstorm, brainstorm, uh, lipstick on the collar. No, women will hate that. This and that. And he's like, okay, imagine you're a woman. Think about it. Tall legs. Supple body. Right, he like falls in love with the woman. <laughs> right, and then he goes, body. <laughs> wait, am I a lesbian? Which is the weirdest mm. fucking yeah, joke. Weird, weird joke. Right. And then uh, he can read women's thoughts and he has superpowers. And, goes to psychiatrist. Know, right? uh, well, it's, isn't it amazing Midler, that it makes Midler, him a really right? good lover? I makes like him that. an incredible lover. Yeah. So yeah. he, he, yeah, he finally... asks Marissa Tomei out. Right? Yeah. And uh, yeah. Right, because she's at been. At first, she's like not that him. into it. She's right. like, let's get this over with. He does she's that really that. manipulative thing where he gets her riled up about the fact that he won't stop asking her out. And it's like, look, don't worry about it, okay? I won't. Just hear relax. You. We'll talk about right. it later. How about tonight at five o'clock? And the guy's like, that was incredible. And oh, yeah. The, yeah guy, no. the guy who is also in something's got to give that yeah. guy. And is like the Griffin Newman part. Yes. Yeah. But um, <laughs> right now, he like knows exactly what to say to Marissa Tomei, goes on the date with her. Right. At first is terrible, then goes in the bathroom, has a pep talk with his penis, mm. yeah. and then goes back in and you hard cut to her rolling over and being like, no one has ever been that inside of me before, which you're like, fucking gross. Yeah, and then totally she, gross. She clarifies like, in my head, I mean. <laughs> right, because he was lying about his grande penis, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Right, which sent him into an existential tailspin. Right. Sure. Um, but then Marissa Tomei is like dropped for a full 50 minutes. Yeah, I mean, he honestly, I think, is just too busy being a psychic. Like, I, I, right, he, I guess right. he's just sort of caught up in all of that. And his daughter, right? I guess there's some drama with her. Yeah, and in he like, takes her shopping, and Helen Hunt's like, "Look at this guy! 
being nice to his daughter. What a right. fucking hero this guy is. Like, <laughs> right. she's thinking this. Well, On her okay, shoes, what's too? What's up with Helen Hunt? We need to talk about we her. Need to yeah. So we're done with Gibson. Let's Bye, just Gibson. concentrate no one on Gibson. You're Hunt. done. Yeah. No one cares. So this Helen is, Hunt, who yeah. rules, yes. and is coming off an Oscar win yes. for As Good As It Gets, and uh, years on Mad About You, right? You know, well, That's the thing we've talked what about. What was She's the famous. premise of Mad About You in one sentence? Okay. Marriage is hard. What if you were okay. married? Yeah. And living in Manhattan? Oh. Yeah, right. uh, no, it was like the thing they always talk about, like the moment where we knew Paul Reiser's genius and how good Helen Hunt was on the show is there's a scene where he's like sitting in the living room, like writing or something. And she walks out with an empty toilet paper tube and she's like gestures to it and goes like, ah, and then runs out. And they were like, it's about like those like fights you don't even have to verbalize in marriage. Like who forgot to buy more toilet paper? Like oh. that's the fucking show. So my mom and I used to watch it all the time. Really? Yeah. But um, that was like the one sitcom she liked. But uh, she won the Oscar uh, for as good as it gets. Do you think that there was some issue at SAG with Helen Hunt and Holly Hunter having the same name? Yeah, they fought <laughs> for who got the ER. They had an arm wrestling match. Helen Hunter. Yeah, Helen Hunter. <laughs> um, but the thing, 2000 was this crazy year because she's on Mad About You after she wins the Oscars, still on that show, can't really make movies. And then this is the year after the show has ended. And right. she makes like four movies. She's in Dr. T and the Women, the Altman movie. She's in Castaway. She's in Castaway. She's in... Pay It Forward. Right. And but it, was this a time when it was easy, I don't know that much about it, to transition from... TV to film because I feel like there was such a massive like yeah. I don't know being on TV was like pejorative I would argue yes, it was still tough sure. and the fact that she won an Oscar while being on a sitcom was kind of like very unprecedented unusual. and yeah. insane yeah. and so that meant like okay whenever this show ends she's at least going to get a real shot at movie stardom and this was her year where it's like okay she's in a couple big movies she's working with really big directors she has Curse of the Jade Scorpion the following year which is a nightmare Horrible movie. movie. Mm -hmm. But she has movie. like those five movies in a row where it was just like, oh my God, Helen Hunt's unavoidable. And then she kind of like not, disappears. And not only that, she does disappear. And not only does she have all these movies, this is a huge hit. What yeah. Women mm -hmm. want. Castaway's, Castaway's a huge hit. It's not like she five, was in bombs. No, two like, of the five biggest movies yeah. of that year. And yet, like for whatever reason, like it's the last we kind of hear of Helen Hunt as like a lead actor. Right. So why? She's directed know. a couple movies. She likes to surf. She likes surfing. Very into surfing. She got another Oscar nomination for the sessions, which everyone forgets. She's good because in everyone forgets she's that really movie good exists. Movie, so. Yeah, um, um, but she's like made a couple films herself. She does. She small had stuff. a kid when she was two, like forty. Like you know, a few years after this. I mean, I just, like. There's not much in her sort of like her, 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 she her biography. Does that's sort of interview. Like, she talks a lot about how much she hates the industry, and I yeah. think like her mm. year, like really playing in this. She was just like, it's a horrible sexist place, and I didn't want to deal with it. And she like was just like, I'm just going to do what I fucking want to do. She clearly loves surfing because she's Love done like surfing. three surfing movies. Yes. So it's like if you right. offer her any part where she gets on a board, she'll do it. She also probably has so much money because I was reading last yeah. night that she, she used to make a so million money. dollars an episode for Mad About right. You. Yes. Right. right. I mean, and that thing and then syndication and all that. Like, yeah, she must have plenty of money. So she she doesn't, doesn't have to worry to about anything. that. Yeah. But I guess as an actor, it's so interesting because I, I, I think about people like Barbara Streisand, who I adore as well, and I'm like, don't you just love it so much, though, that right. you wouldn't ever want to stop doing it? Sure. Like, And then when I see these people that disappear because the industry is so awful, I'm like, well, I guess. Yeah, she may have just literally just hated the role she was being offered. Like, right. but, yeah. but you never have that moment. Like, we're both similarly crazy people about the work and how much we like these art If I had and, $40 million, though, and I could just finance whatever movie I actually wanted to make. That's my thought, is if I sure. had that much success, I, I would, would just, just make it. my own shit. Yeah. But there are moments where I get so fed up with this, that, or the other that I'm like, God, I wish I could find something else I like doing. Oh, totally. And what even about, if like, it wasn't podcasting. a job. But that's the thing. If you're like Helen Hunt and you have like $40 million, Right. I'm saying once you have that amount of money and then you're like, I don't know, I love surfing. Right. If you found that much joy from surfing. True. And that's maybe the you're question. just done. Maybe you're just done. Right. But we're crazy people who do like four different things and right. are like, listen to my album. Go see me do stand up. <laughs> I can't stop. Yeah. And then you get then you realize that all of those industries are just as bad. Right. That's the other thing we found that we talk about when we have depressing. Hangouts. But what about her character? Like, I mean. I, I mean, I feel like you said all the, the sort of good yeah, stuff I mean, about I think this you character. Kind of Darcy it. is yeah. her name. Darcy. Um, she's cool. 
Um, but she is a little backgrounded in this movie, which kind of irritates She's totally me. backgrounded in this movie, but I think what she brings to the foreground is something that a lot of women don't get to hear a lot, which is that, like, you know, it's okay to say, I want to be loved for how successful I am. Right. I don't want that to be part of why I'm left all the I, time. I also just genuinely, and I do think this is just a Nancy Myers flourish, like, I love the empty apartment scene. Because yeah. I like the, like, being like, you know what, this is exciting, you know, like, like rather than just think of it as sort of lame or superficial. Like, now let me just know. say, two apartments that are kind of key to this movie, okay. but a film weirdly lacking in kitchens. Now, we've established that on this miniseries, we're going to cut once an episode to a remote segment from our special kitchen correspondent, Romley Newman. So now we're going to oh cut God, over live amazing. to yep. Romley's Kitchen Corner. Welcome to Romley's Kitchen Corner. And here is your host, Miss Romley Newman. In her kitchen. Hello, I'm here talking about Mel Gibson's lack of a kitchen and what women want. I would argue that this... I, w- I think we've probably seen the kitchen in this movie, but didn't know it was a kitchen. Because this is the kind of stupid house where everything's hidden and very sleek and very modern. And, I like, you know... My gal Nancy didn't put, like, a huge Viking range in Mel Gibson's kitchen, which is fair. But um, the entire house has this very male vibe, and what I think is the kitchen looks the same. So cute. Thank you, Romilly. Yep. Thank you, Romilly. But this is the the most, the least kitcheny Ryers movie. Right, and you kind of want to see Helen Hunt's kitchen and the lack of appliances and have her tell you what it's going to be, but you don't Right, but her kitchen is is not yet built, and Mel Gibson's kitchen is unused, I guess. Yes. I mean, his his cupboard is bare. Yeah. He likes an onion bagel. Yeah. He's so gross. He must, oh, you know, I love an onion I bagel. Mean, he must I, just yeah. like stink because oh, he's just like cigars and onion bagels. And I love, yeah. yeah, the bottle of red wine. Honestly, when I was watching him drink a bottle of red wine, smoke cigarettes, and like flip through the TV channels, I was like, I want to do that right now. Yeah. It looks fun. I mean, yeah. it does you look know, very fun. Write some ads about how it's great to, yeah. you know. You can live that life. I don't uh, know. But Helen Hunt, I mean, after being introduced, kind of isn't in the rest of the first hour of the movie, which is more conventionally like it's true Bruce Almighty ish, where and it's then, just like, right. how does this guy use magic his powers? powers? Right, and then the second half is their relationship, I guess. Right, then yeah. it really becomes about the two where of they them. become this like partner, but she seeds like ground to him like yeah. sort of passive like you know and I oh my god that was the other thing that was so incredible her attitude about his success right is it, it's I think it's kind of unaddressed because it's just kind of like normal but it was just incredible to see like her humbleness and her right. kindness mm-hmm. about his genius yeah like that that is she so lets quintessentially him do the presentation yeah. like when she gets fired she's like I think yeah, I kind of deserve well, to get fired it. right which is crazy I mean it's yeah. internalized she's, misogyny she's like, like 101 yeah but especially because the reputation that precedes her a reputation spread by shitty men in this movie is that she's like what with a female Darth Vader Vader she bitch or whatever they yeah, call he her said, yeah I hear she's a real bitch on wheels right. or whatever that's like I think a shitty man eater which doesn't mean that she like well i've always thought of that term as being like oh you like tear through men sure. like with, yeah right. or, but this is that right. she's a man eater that she's a cannibal is what they mean yeah, in this yeah they mean that she'll roast him on a very spit. subtextual yeah i mean that would be an interesting second hour of the movie if yeah. her just like roasting he, he's like in a cauldron and she's like you know adding right, stock right. Yeah. she's a witch um a shittier version of this movie though would make her an ice queen until well, that's the Nancy Myers the scene touch. where they have and the Helen Hunt, the, the bonding in the bar. Helen and then it's like, is, oh, she is a yeah, person. Right, right. Helen right. Hunt's a really oh, I humanist love and actor. already like sc- yeah. screamed about on her as good as it gets episode. But yes, like she can make anyone seem like just a real person. It's yeah. an incredibly difficult thing to do. Like Mel Gibson does not feel like that real a person in this movie. You know, he yeah. feels like a movie star yes. who is like and maniac, barging around. Right. Yes, right. a person. Well, who's even the one way that Helen Hunt right looks, like Helen Hunt is super beautiful, but it's like a very she's so hot. She's so hot, but she looks she's like so a real person. Hot. She but looks yeah, like it, a real. Which sounds she, like a backhanded thing, but there's something no. about the fact that even the way she's styled in movies, yeah, isn't glamorous, and she well, presents she's herself. Glamorous, Nancy Myers I think, in this movie. characters yeah. look like real people. Like and yes. again, and they can be glamorous. They can be dressed amazingly, like and all that. But like none of them ever look like sort of ludicrous. There's she also, looks like female. your friend's hot mom. There's also, yeah, I agreed. Yeah. Uh, I have a crush on Helen Hunt in, yeah. Yeah. in almost any Helen Hunt movie. Yeah, no, she's really there lovely. There also is something, I don't know if it's tied to like the deepness of her voice and how fast she talks. Great voice. But mm-hmm. there's something about how she performs vocally and how sort of no nonsense she is that makes her feel very like, it, she has a lot of fucking integrity mm-hmm. in whatever she is in, you know? And you buy that whatever her character is supposed to be doing in their field. 
Um, but I like that this movie presents her as a reasonable person the entire time who all the men are terrified of for no reason. Yeah. And that scene isn't her changing. It's him just sort of like cutting through it all. The thing that's kind of weird about this movie is it's a, a romantic comedy, but the first half is sort of just high concept comedy. Mm-hmm. And then once it goes to the romance, their romance isn't very funny. Like it's their romance is not that interesting. It gets pretty straight. I don't think they have a ton of chemistry. They don't have I much think chemistry. She's I, really I'm good on her own. He is able to dampen his insanity more than I remembered he did at this last second. <laughs> he becomes pretty successfully subdued and human. I guess so. As as much as he yeah. can pull that off. But it's a lot movie. of him just like literally saying a thing he just heard her think. Like yeah. over and over again. Which is the weird aspect to this movie is that like the people are like. You should listen to women, I guess. Like, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, like, well, you know, yeah. Again, again, it feels like the progress he makes is so incremental. Which like I kept <laughs> on. At, I, at Liz this Reed, point. I feel like it's just like, hey, man. <laughs> it's better That's than all nothing. we're looking for. <laughs> and also maybe this is a little That's more all we can hope for. Her. Right. Um and the other thing though is like I kept on at this point comparing the movie to Groundhog Day, right? Which is a movie sure. where a guy is similarly presented as being just like unbearable at the beginning. Uh-huh. And by the end you buy that he's sort of like gained humanity. Right. And the two things that Groundhog Day does are one, they like make it that he's there for like years. Right. That he it's like he's an stuck eternity. in like a fucking yes. hell. Right. Where he really has the time to change. But that movie's about like Buddhism. Like that movie's yes. about like rebuilding your soul. Right. Like, yeah. The other thing Jeez. with that movie is he tries all the shitty Mel Gibson like right. I'm going to use this to my advantage right. and gets punished for all of that pretty early on. Whereas Mel Gibson is rewarded for just parroting back what woman Yeah. Think, right. And then, up until the very end in which he punishes himself. Yeah, let's talk about the end of the movie. Right. Yeah. So like first he rescues Judy Greer because she's sad. Oh my god, wait. We need to talk about his spirit Damon in Chinatown. Oh, oh, oh yes. sure, right. Because that, that happens during that scene, right? <laughs> she where... as another woman character whose thoughts he cannot hear. <laughs> he cannot hear. Yeah. Uh, and I guess Judy Greer lives in Chinatown. So in he's the like best going apartment to, ever. I know, apparently. incredible yeah. apartment. Yeah. And she's what, a messenger? And she's yeah. this sort of sardonic, <laughs> like funny, quote unquote, right. funny suicidal girl in the office. I guess she's right. She has she has a great voice, he's realizing, right. I guess. He's like a very, very like, acidic dark, wit. Dark sense of humor, but she's right. funny. Yeah. And then I guess finally realizes, like, oh, maybe she wasn't kidding around about being so she depressed. She said, like, someday I, I won't show up, I'll kill her. myself, and I'll leave all the files there for them to deal with. And he one day sees that all the files are there yeah so he rushes to help her he meets a silent <laughs> guardian angel <laughs> yeah. type and he already know, at this point has bathes him in spark he tries yeah, to replicate the experiment and re-electrocute himself he does that doesn't work though for a while he can't hear women's thoughts but for no clear reason it just comes back suddenly yeah i don't know yeah i like him calling 411 to test it out and it's like of course it's a robot <laughs> right, but he can hear thoughts over the phone, though. Yes, right, because the Helen Hunt scene yes. is kind of funny right. that yeah. he doesn't know what she's said out loud or not. Yeah. Um. But yeah, he goes to Chinatown. This woman guides him, can't read her thoughts, and then he's electrocuted by the hanging lights. Sure. Because it's a rainstorm. Right. Yeah. Goes in to save Judy Greer, gives her the job she always wanted. Right. That's mostly how he addresses the situation by being like, "I'm sorry." Instead of like, "Hey, hire you. do you want to talk about hey, your yeah, manic right. depression?" Right. 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 Like, Where he let's goes work like through some of this stuff. Right. I'm so glad you didn't kill yourself. And she's like, "What are you talking about?" And he's, he's like, like I, yeah, "I got this really stressful job for him." I <laughs> sensed it. <laughs> and then she goes like, "You sensed it for me," which I like that she plays it like that's even sure, worse. Right. She's right. If yeah. I'm putting out the vibe to everyone, yeah, she's like mortified at yeah. the very idea. And she's so good in this scene. She's yeah. great. I love right. Judy Greer. But this Thank is like you. kind of the first scene in the movie where he does a totally thankless, nice thing. Sure. Every other scene, it's like he gets some gain off of like giving women what they want. Sure. You know? I mean, right after this scene, he runs to Helen Hunt and says, like, I stole all your ideas. And she fires him. And she fires him. It's so... And then she says, is that it? Or whatever she Mm -hmm. says. I love that Yeah, and he's all mopey, right. And then they kiss. Like, what kind of woman would I be... If uh, what kind of shining knight would I be? Right, <laughs> great line. If if I didn't take the chance to rescue my, my and love. they kiss yeah. and like roll credits, like yeah. it's like that. Like she's I was like, glad, We're out. honestly, yeah. it's a two yeah. hour and seven minute it's long a film. Long it's like that's seconds. like yeah. So the only other scene we kind of touched on it, but the Lola scene is weird because in a lot of movies it would be like, oh, this is the first time you get to see him successfully seduce a woman and his increased abilities as a lover, and then you'd never see her again. 
which would be kind of callous in and of itself. Is that that she's creepily waiting outside his house at dawn? Having right. like a breakdown, having a breakdown, and then she's in her head, hours. an even more intense, like, yeah. you know, break a monologue. Yeah. Right. And she's like, either I'm unlovable or you're gay. Right. Please, so please, please tell, tell me until you're gay. gay. Please tell me you're gay. Like she's like saying it over and over in her head. Which yeah. is a gross that it's like she's demanding that he's gay and that that's the only explanation for a man being sensitive, as you said. Yes. And B, it's also gross that he like lies to her. So I was like, when that scene came back on, I was like, oh, it's kind of nice this movie is making him pay for the fact that he's callous towards women. And it's like, right, right, no, he right. just keeps lying. Yeah. Like, it sort of sucks. Well, he's finally on. That's not the end of the hero's journey, yes, though. Right. right. That's sort of yeah. in the middle where he's, yes. he's uh, bottoming out, I guess. He does. He, oh, and also he's nice to his daughter who gets uh, jilted at the prom because she won't sleep with their where they're sitting at the yeah. parallel dressing rooms. Yeah. She's so good. She's, the, so, and she's good. so good. There's the really long finding a prom dress montage set to really what a girl long. Wants. Incredibly long and no dialogue, but a lot of mugging. Right? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> like, I was like, wait, they. C- why are they mugging? They could talk. <laughs> right. And he like holds up a, a dry erase board that says like, not that one. Yeah, I know. And it's like, <laughs> well, yeah, this is a montage, but it's not like, you know that you're in a montage. You're a person. <laughs> so use your words. Where'd the dry erase board come <laughs> uh, from? Uh, yeah, yeah. What? I'll say Lola, this is one of the few times a, a guest has made me like a movie more. Oh, I'm which is so a major because I've been dreading this one. Sure. I thought oh you God. were going to hate this film as well. Yeah, you said you texted me that it's it it's like I said a it's fever a, dream. Yeah, yeah I said where like, every woman wants to sleep with Mel Gibson. Well, that part is weird to watch present day because it's just hard to uh, remember a time where that was the case. <laughs> I mean, like yeah. you know, like movie star Mel Gibson. Like I'm kind of into it. Here's the other know. thing, though, about being an actress divorced from content. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, is that you learn that like 99 percent of male actors are great at presenting or acting like they're sexy or interesting sure. or whatever. Yeah. And in real life, they aren't. So I've been kind of like it, all of these movies get ruined for me because I'm just like, it's the, it's the way that once you start like working on films, it's uh, like, you're like, Oh, yeah. shot reverse shot. Like right. you begin to like, be totally taken out of the yeah. thing that they want you to believe because you just know how it gets made. You right. see the trick. And I, I mean, I've met a lot of really wonderful male actors, but I'm just saying that there is, um, there is something about a man, a fail, a famous male artist that they, where they just begin to adopt the qualities of like that. We, that we resent the most in women, like vanity and insecurity. Yes. And so I was watching that movie being like, Mel Gibson, probably vain and insecure and controlling and terrible. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, I mean, and a very compelling actor. Uh, well, I'll say, very like, compelling. I do think there's something to, like, great actors, it's all about how you connect with your scene partner, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's what we, like, value most, you know, in this field with the people we work with, but also I think when we see great acting on screen, we're the types of people who like go like, oh my God, look at how connected they are, how much they're listening. Like great quote unquote movie stars are usually just about how they interact with themselves. Yeah, that's such like a good the point. section of him in the apartment by himself is kind of like a sure. key yeah. text for he's Mel Gibson. This, yeah. Where it's just like he's doing a dance routine, he's yeah. doing comedy and like the makeup and everything. Yeah. And it's that sort of vanity, like protection of their image, knowing their angles, mm-hmm. knowing their moves, knowing what the persona totally. is. Totally. Because he doesn't really have any chemistry with her. But he's super fucking compelling in close ups. Yeah. You know? And totally. Even this weird, like, sandpaper hand interview I'm always <laughs> watching with him. When, he's it's like, compelling. I watch it because I'm just like, even when he's clearly a lunatic, he's just so fucking watchable. Mm-hmm. Like, there's something about him, even when it's a, a train crash. We got to play the box office game. We do a game where I try to remember the box office from when the movies came out because I'm a crazy person. Oh as my you know. God. So this is December 15th, 2000. Second That's biggest film romantic comedy of all time. Do you guys remember what you were doing? December 15th, 2000. Right. I was seeing one of the movies on this list. Buying Christmas presents. This I was, was nine. a big year. Yeah. This movie came out number one. I was 11. Number one. This was like right before we met. Yeah. Number one. It came out number one and it was at number one again over the Christmas weekend. No. Cast no. Away was. Oh. Oh, interesting. Helen Hunt. So Helen Hunt was like, Jesus, Jesus. fucking Christ. Hunt on Hunt. These always count a week with any. That's Number insane. two, though, is okay. a, a teen comedy. Number two is a teen comedy. So you can comedy. just get the, guess the shit from that. The sometimes. year is 2000. Huh. Um, was it I a, saw it in theaters. Was it a new release? Or with had my it been friend a, Tom. Can I guess? New release, yes. Yeah. 
She's all that. Perfectly good guess, but no. That was a March release, right? See, he knows this shit. Ew. I, don't I know. <laughs> I'm creeped Ooh, out is by that. Right. <laughs> um, okay, wait. Let me let me think through this. So it was a teen release. Was it like a minted teen star at this point? Uh, it's one of them's in a TV show, and the other one was just in like another teen comedy. Was it a Dawson's Creek person? No. No. Sitcom. A sitcom, and they're a teenager. Yeah. Interesting. The teen sick <gasps> drive me crazy. Nope. Oh, good fuck. guess though. Oh, Eric Balfour's in that too. That's oh close God. though. I mean, sure, teen sitcom. Teen sitcom. So like, w- was it like on a kid- sitcom about teens? No, it was on Fox. I think I can't remember what it was on. Ben's looking. It's like, like kind of like a me kind of movie. Yeah. Oh yeah. oh oh oh! Yeah. I know what it is. Of course, I got thrown off by teen Go, movie. Well, it's a teen movie. I, I, think, I guess I think they're supposed to be in their twenties in that movie. It's really? Dude, Where's My Car, right? It's Dude, Where's My Car. Oh my God, I would have never, yeah. Because they live alone I guess in that movie. Yeah, I guess you're right. They, live they, don't, have par- like, they don't live with their parents. Some teenagers yeah, I guess, live alone. It's kind of, I guess it's kind of uh, vague, like what who they are. You're right. Because <laughs> it kind of just wakes up with them being like, right. Dude, Where's My Car? That is right. what I was doing that I just weekend, remember my mom. Amount of, of character development. Right. In that my movie. mom did not see this movie. But I remember her, every time she saw the poster, she'd be like, that's a good poster. And then she would like do Ashton Kutcher going like, I want to like, see that poster. Can you pull it up? Yeah, and it was one of those movies where everyone made fun of the title, but it was also the most effective title in the world yeah. because, like, the concept was right there. Um, they tried to make a the sequel. Here is, here is the poster. Yeah. <laughs> Where's my car? My favorite part of that movie is <laughs> no end in. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, I, I did that with a friend this weekend. Right. Zoltar, there's the whole alien cult Yeah, there's thing. a lot of crazy shit in that movie. That movie's weird. And then it's he goes really on good. to make Harold and Kumar, yes. which is the better version of this movie. Um, Because no. this, this movie was shot as a stoner film, and they want to make a PG-13, so all references to weed are cut out of the movie, which is very odd. Right. They just seem like idiots. Yeah, it's a weird movie. <laughs> I was yeah, going right. to say, they tried to make a sequel, and they never <laughs> came up with a good enough concept to meet the high bar of the I understand. Film. Number three at the, the box reason office. I want to say Griffin, I, I gotta go. Do you know what the title was supposed to be of the sequel? No. Seriously, dude, where's my car? Number three at the box office. It's the biggest movie of the year. Did Seriously, dude, where's my car? Seriously, dude, where's my car? Did it come out? No, but oh. I thought that was fun. What's the things they have tattooed on their backs? Dude, <laughs> dude, sick. and cool. Sick, sick. 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 You're right. No, or sweet. Sweet, sweet. dude, what's and yours sweet. Sick? Dude, what's yours? Sweet. Yeah. I'm rewatching that tonight. Yeah, maybe it's a, it's like a, a ten minute sequence in my memory. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number three, the biggest movie of uh, this Dr. Seuss is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Yeah. Oh, I saw that. A movie. I saw all these movies in yeah. theaters. Yeah, mm-hmm. This was a big holiday season. Number four is the better sort of family movie of this moment, uh, like coming out this week. Of 2000, it was the better family movie of the moment. Was it Emperor's New Groove? Yes. Which rules. Oh, I love that movie. Great movie. So good. Such a good movie. Number five is an action movie. I think we've talked about it before. Is it a Jet Li movie? No, it's like a... uh, It's like a... I'm trying to think the action stars. If I tell you the subgenre, you'll just know. Uh, But it is like a star-driven movie like that? No, no. It's It's not. not. No, not at all. Uh... It's like a thriller, I guess. Father son, I think. It's a father Pretty son. Pretty sure they're father and son. And there's some other people. So it's like two big movie stars. No, pop- no, no. Stop with the big movie okay. stars. They're not they're medi- medium movie stars. Interesting. Medium movie stars. Like the 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 poster is like the thing they're on. <laughs> Fucking hell. It's a mountain movie. Oh, it's not Vertical Limit, it's is Vertical it? Limit. Yeah. Oh I knew if I said Mountain Who's in movie? Vertical Limit? Chris O'Donnell and Dennis Quaid. So you know that's no, still how I know what the now. difference between vertical and horizontal is? I, same with fucking me. <laughs> and the last time that came up on this podcast, I said the same thing. Dude, that's dude, the only that's way crazy. I know the difference between the two. I just go, which one was Chris O'Donnell? Bill about? Paxton. Bill Thank Paxton. You. Not 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 Dennis Quaid's the dad in the other Ice movie. Yeah, uh, Day Tomorrow. After Tomorrow. <laughs> Oh my god, I remember that. I, I will just say, Ooh. I know you have to go, yeah, David, I, go. I know you have to go, Lola, but uh, I was looking at 2000 at the box office because I wanted to see where this movie ranked amongst the, the top of the year, yeah. and 2000 feels like the last like real pure movie star year. What website are you on? Box Office, box office Mojo. Mojo. Oh, okay. Like um, right, which I check as if it's like Politico. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you go like number one, Grinch, Jim Carrey. Number two, Hank's Castaway. Tom Cruise, Mission Impossible. Gladiator, Russell Crowe. What Women Want, Gibson. Like Perfect Storm, Clooney, but that's sort of him rising. Meet the Parents, De Niro. Like it's like every movie is like the poster was the person's face. And no, you're right. You're absolutely was right. Was sold yes, on yes. these like movie stars. Three Aaron blockbusters are just superhero. Movies, what lies yes. beneath? And the outliers are like Crouching Tiger, which was an anomaly that we talked about, 
and then X Men and Scary Movie, which then would like sure, change like the, the future, industry. Right. right. Uh, I love Scary Movie too. Two. That's weirdly the one that has like aged the best. I what feel like so two? Funny. Is that the one that begins the with like the, the Exorcist? Like, the house. Yeah, it begins the house. with the Exorcist, and right. then it's What Lies Beneath. It's weirdly right, a What right. Lies so Beneath. Funny. Which is the one where they push parody. the piano down the stairs? Is that one or two? I, I think know. that's two. I think that's two. Tobias Funke is in Scary Movie Two, and uh, Chris Elliott, who's really good in it too. He plays right, the guy with right. The hand. Hand. Um, <laughs> I, I've not seen any of those movies since theater. Like two, I don't. Two really, I had it on DVD, and I would watch it on my portable DVD player like once a week. That and right. That's a throwback. And Pootie Tang. Uh, I mean, the the holy trinity of early 2000s cinema. Yeah. Uh, scary Movie 2 is definitely the champagne of scary movies. And yeah. on that note, Lola, thank you so much for being oh here. Oh, my God. This was so fun. Was thank it? you guys. See, this yeah, was actually, fun. This okay. was really fun. I almost canceled, and I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd have fun if you actually did it, and I knew you would be dreading doing it. Right, right. right. I uh, I loved watching well, that. I love listening to you talk about movies. Hell yeah. 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 I mean, now if you I didn't, love listening to we, you talk about movies. We wouldn't be friends if you didn't like hearing me talk about movies because that's 90% of the yeah, conversation. Yeah. I think one of the last times we hung out, you went on a six hour uh, rant about why Will Smith was the best. Well, that sounds like something Griffin would do. I don't do. think this was the last time. Okay. I, that I, was one of the last times I wanted yes. to hang out with you. I mean, this is, why, <laughs> this is why I do a podcast with him is we want to hang out and this is really the only way we to We used to just do, do these conversations and right. no one paid us for them. Right. Wow. You get paid? Uh, yeah, yeah, great cool. ad How much do I get? Bye, guys. Yeah, you'll get a big cut. <laughs> um, thank you guys for having me. This thanks for so being fun. here. Your album available now. It's available. It's out. People Heart should West. get it. It's great. Get it. Hearthead West and uh, a Gemini movie you're in from this year. That's very good. And it's on Hulu. Oh, that's right such now. a good movie. I'll plug that. It's a great movie. Yeah, it's on it, Hulu. It. People can watch it for free. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what the residual structure is. I hope it's positive for me. Very, very <laughs> hefty. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you all for listening. Please Here's remember to rate, review, subscribe. Thanks to Andrew Gouda for social media, Joe Bowen and Pat Rounds for artwork, Lee Montgomery for our theme song. Uh, go to blankies.red.com for some real nerd shit, Tee Public for merchandise, and as always, chicken round fox. All right. What do women want, guys? We're, we're going <laughs> to get to the bottom me. of it. Yeah. Are we? I mean... I feel like this movie actually kind of did nail it. You did, yeah, I will oh, yeah. say I had amazing sex after watching this movie. Wow. Isn't that weird? Did you, like, did you watch the movie with the person? And oh, No. Yeah. Yeah. They oh, were yes. watching okay. the movie. Right. With you were right. watching it. Right. Okay. The only other movie that has like inspired great sex is I Am Love. Uh, oh, the, that uh, makes sense. That's and a sex also, movie. It's like an yeah, aphrodisiac. Yeah. 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 Also, Call Me By Your Name. That's the same Similar director. Thing. And, same director. Uh, yeah, 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 I know. And then, and then Nancy Meyer. Yeah. <laughs> so those are the I never Luca knew. Guadagninos, Nancy Myers. <laughs> yeah. Very one one's drawing from the other. Yeah. This because this movie is Mel Gibson fucking a peach, right? That is the opening. That <laughs> was the opening it, but they scene. cut it. It's yeah. in the director's. That was the sequel they never made. Was what fruit want? <laughs> <laughs> right. He can yeah. hear all fruit, and they're just like, just come in me. Yeah. That's what I want. <laughs> I want <you> to come. <laughs> and then feed me to Army Hammer. Fill me with your juice. <laughs> um. Okay, I'm just, I'm going to do this, whatever. Are you reading the trivia on IMDb right now? We'll get to it, but yeah. He's, he's going to do a quote, quote from the so film. I have so many quotes. Oh, okay. And then he's going to he's gonna put the word podcast in place of one of the words from this quote. And because this is a movie that neither of us, like, probably remember, like, right. already. We won't Wait, you know guys what haven't recently rewatched the Oh, no, I just rewatched, rewatched it, but, okay. like. I watched yeah. it, as you guys know. I'm, okay. I'm going to say the grossest opening quote. Okay, we okay. ready? Okay, oh, Sure. Ready.